and uh, we will start the uh, set of three lectures uh, by uh, Professor Kandaswamy Subramanian's talk. Uh, Professor uh, Subramanian who is an expert on astrophysical magnetic fields and uh, nonlinear dynamos will be talking to us about uh, galactic magnetism from a battery to a turbulent dynamo. So, Professor Subramanian. Thank you. Let me try to share the screen. Can you see? I hope. Can you see the screen and can you see me? What can be seen? Okay, great, fantastic. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, symposium. It has been really wonderful to hear so many different talks by all various people, some of whom I know, some of whom I don't know. Professor Chitre, uh, in whose honor this symposium is, is very special to some of us in different ways. And for me, he's very special as my one of my supervisors, PhD supervisors. I had the fortune of having two PhD supervisors. One was Professor Chitre, the other was Professor Narlika. And uh, most of my PhD work, uh, half of it was done with Professor Chitre and Narsima. And Narsima gave you a flavor of this uh, yesterday yesterday on gravitational lensing. But I kind of uh, left the field to them. I completely moved out of this more or less, except occasionally being dragged by people. And all the stuff about magnetism, I actually, to some extent, I first got inspired or seeded by Professor Chitre's talk in TIFR at the end of my PhD. And I kind of found very, he was talking about some outflows driven by magnetic fields from star forming regions. And I found it pretty interesting, but I just forgot about it. And I, until I met uh, Leon Mestel when I was a postdoc. In fact, my postdoc was supposed to be John Barrow, but uh, Leon Mestel was also there. And towards the end of the postdoc, I started talking to him a little more about magnetism. And while Professor Chitre drove the battery in me and seeded the field, Leon was the first person with whom I wrote papers on dynamics. Then when I returned, I kind of wrote one paper with Narsimha and Chitre um, on a battery effect, which I will talk about. Now, <clears throat> so that's why I put Professor Chitre, Narsimha and Leon Mestel first. The next line is consisting of all the PhD students who were my PhD students and who are all now independent uh, faculty. Pallavi is a faculty at TIFR. Luke is at Rochester still. Um, Sharanya is at IA. Then uh, Abhijit was a postdoc at uh, Ayuka and now he's at uh, Lausanne. Kishore did a nice project with me on MSc project. Now he's a PhD student here working with Nishant Singh. And Axel and Anwar are my constant collaborators to whom I owe quite a lot of ideas. So to summarize, basically I, what I want to convey in the next uh, less than half an hour is firstly that the universe is magnetized. If you didn't want, if you thought that that needed to be convinced of, I'm sure you don't. Uh, right from planets on which we are sitting, one of the planet Earth, to stars like the sun, nearby stars, stars that we can see, nearby and high redshift galaxies, the plasma and galaxy clusters, the intergalactic medium, perhaps the intergalactic medium in voids, although that's more controversial. It's very not very difficult to explain the presence of the magnetic fields or magnetic energy density, but it's still quite a bit of challenge to explain its coherence. And I will say something about that. It turns out that uh, you need first a seed magnetic field, and I'm going to talk about a particular seed mechanism. Then you need some way of growing that field, and that's called a dynamo. And I'm going to talk something about dynamos. I'm not going to talk about this fluctuation dynamo, which is a very favorite of mine, and Amit has also worked on this. 
but I'm going to concentrate today on what's called the large scale turbulent dynamo. If you had attended Bhushan's talk, you would have got some flavor of that. I'm going to say, I'll more or less go to more fundamental difficulties which I perceive in this field. Another thing which I uh, have thought about somewhat is primordial magnetic fields, which can arise in inflation phase transitions. I'm not at all going to say anything about that. A lot of the stuff that we have done is uh, now gathered in a book which we have submitted with Anwar Shukuram and myself uh, to Cambridge University Press, astro called Astrophysical Magnetic Fields from Galaxies to the Early Universe. We don't touch upon stars or accretion at all. And I've taken out a quote which, I, which we made uh, in that book preface. And what we said there was we were very fortunate to have an opportunity to learn from Sashikumar Chitre, Jayant Nandikar, and Yakov Borisovich Zeldovich from early stages of our academic lives. And their wisdom and depth remain our guiding light. We submitted this book in February, and I wanted to send Professor Chitre a copy of at least the preface and the contents. I told him that we are going writing this book, but unfortunately he passed away in January. But uh, it was a lot to him and uh, we will see how. <coughs> see. So let me get on to the topic. I'm going to talk about galactic fields uh, focus and it's always good to start with the picture. And this is a picture of M51 very famous nearby spiral galaxy, also called the Whirlpool Galaxy. And what you see is the optical light, which is in white and stuff, the starlight. And you also see in these contours, the radio emission at six centimeters from this galaxy by Fletcher and Rainer Beck, a very detailed picture. And what you can also see are these dashes, which are all the polarized emission, the orientation. From polarization, you don't know which way the field points, whether it points this way or that way. But you need Faraday rotation to break that degeneracy. And Amit already talked a little bit about Faraday rotation. And what you can make out is that there is some random fields, of course, uh, of uh, the total fields are now estimated to be about 10 microgauss. There is a random field component. But over and above that, there is a overall large scale coherent field ordered on 10 kiloparsec kind of scales. Um, in the zero order, it's axisymmetric. And if you go further, it's about, it has got some relation to the spiral structure that you see, which is also very interesting. And these fields, the ordered fields, are a few times smaller than the random fields. So it's, you have to really work hard to get at them. But it is these large scale ordered galactic fields that I'm interested in, in this particular talk. And we think that maybe it's something to do with the mean field dynamo. The problem is that as Amit also described in this talk, the interstellar medium is turbulent. The scales of stirring of this turbulence are typical scale of supernova remnants, which are tens of parsecs to let's say 100 parsec. The field is ordered on kiloparsec and larger scales. So it's one place where you get some order out of chaos in some sense. And that's what makes it very interesting. And that's also what makes it uh, a challenge to explain this. So <clears throat> I'll start by talking about magnetic universe and dynamos. One may naively think that if there is magnetic fields given by, let's say, a primordial mechanism, and you have an extremely good conductor, then it will not decay because these astrophysical systems are very large. Turns out that's not true. For the Earth, for example, the field decays on a time scale about 10,000 years. So you will know that the Earth's field has been there for a billion years or something. For galaxies, if the field is strong, they drive motions and they kind of transfer the energy from, uh, from whatever magnetic field to kinetic energy, which can be dissipated either by driving turbulence or by just viscosity if the viscosity is strong. So you need always to maintain the field. And the way we think about maintaining these fields for the students, I'm sure a lot of people know all this, for the undergrad students who I thought a lot of them have signed up, is by using Faraday's law of induction. Faraday's law of induction says partial dB by dt is curl of field. If you have a curl of the electric field, you can change or maintain the magnetic field. 
And if you ask what is where the curl comes from, if you write Ohm's law in a wonky way, instead of J is equal to sigma E plus B cross B, you write it as E equal to B cross B by C J by sigma and take its curl by inductive term, this V cross B term, you can generate or maintain magnetic fields. And you also, you can use Ampere's law in the non-relativistic limit and substitute for J and you get a nice equation called the induction equation just for the magnetic field alone. So given a velocity field, you can work out how the magnetic field changes with time. The velocity field itself will back, there'll be a back reaction of the magnetic field because there's a Lorentz force. If you're given a current and a field, you have a force on the fluid, on the plasma, and that will back react and change the velocity field. So it's a highly nonlinear system, which you are trying to understand. And so you have to either make guesses, closures, simulations. You put all your technology behind that. An interesting thing is what is called flux freezing. If you take a loop of uh, a loop in the, in the plasma, and you look at all the magnetic flux through that loop. And as the plasma moves around and generally you have a good conductor, the magnetic flux, which is B dot dS is frozen in, which means D phi by DT goes to zero as eta goes to zero. Eta is a resistivity, which is the inverse of the conductivity. The relative importance of the inductive to the resistive term is given by the Reynolds number you can define a magnetic Reynolds number. And similarly, in the fluid case, you can define a fluid Reynolds number as a relative importance of the nonlinear term here to the viscous term. And these are typically very large in galaxies. Magnetic Reynolds number is 10 to the 19, fluid Reynolds number 10 to the 8, if I put these kind of numbers here. <clears throat> what Bush mentioned, ambipolar drift can play a role, but they don't de decrease itself that in these dynamos, they don't saturate the dynamo, unlike what he was talking about for the sun. As you can see, the induction equation is linear in the magnetic field. So if you start with B equal to zero, it's a perfectly valid solution for all times. Because of which you need to make a seed magnetic field. And that's what I call a battery. The general idea of a battery is that you have no current in a wire, you connect it to a battery and you get a current. So you need some kind of a cosmic battery. Typically, all batteries produce very weak fields, and so you need to amplify it to the observed levels, and that's what you do in a dynamo. So this is where Professor Chitre and Narsima come in, because this is the one paper which we wrote together, which had nothing to do with gravitational lensing. And uh, this was also the last paper I probably wrote with both of them. And this is the only paper on magnetic fields I wrote with them. So this is called the Bierman battery. All astrophysical batteries basically use the fact that positive and negative charges are not, is, are not symmetric. For example, the proton is more massive than the electron. So for example, if you apply forces, you apply a pressure gradient to these two fluids, the protons will tend to just stay quietly. They are big guys and they're lazy. The electrons will want to move, but an electric field will develop to couple them back together. And that electric field can be simply estimated by balancing the force due to the electric field on the electron by which pressure gradient. This is a very simplistic view of how this Beerman electric field uh, arises. You can do it for, by looking at both the set of equations, subtracting them, getting a generalized Ohm's law. This electric field, if it's basically, if it's uh, curl is zero, many times this happens because pressures are depending only on the density then you can write it as gradient of something and its curl will be zero. Then it'll only produce some slight charge separation. You have such an electric field in any atmosphere, for example, the Earth's atmosphere, very weak. But if it has a curl, then from Faraday's law of induction, the magnetic field can grow. And you can see that this part of the electric field has nothing to do with the magnetic field. So it's like an inhomogeneous source term. That's why it's a battery term. So if I take curl of this, then it is non-zero provided the gradients of the density and gradients of temperature are not parallel to each other. And you may wonder where this comes from. For example, Beerman's original idea was that this comes in rotating stars because there's meridional circulation. These gradients need not be parallel to each other. Where we applied it uh, in a paper in 94 is this can arise if you have reionization of the universe, for example. 
And this is where having your cosmology hat and your plasma hat come together. Uh, so for example, when there are sources like galaxies and quasars that turn on to ionize the universe, the temperature gradient is perpendicular to the ionization front. There are lots of density fluctuations in the universe, which are all waiting to collapse to form galaxies and clusters and all that. So that density gradient is not correlated with the temperature gradient. And because of this, you can get a non-zero curl and that can lead to a dB by dt, be estimated about 10 to the minus 20 Gauss due to this effect. It was later simulated by Gnedin, Ferreira and Zweibel and they found a similar kind of number. It has also been applied by many people, including just after us, in structure formation shocks by Russell Kulsud, Ostreicher, Chen, and Dong Xiu Yu. So this is how the induction equation gets modified by this expert. So you can see this, this 10 to the minus 20, still very small compared to the micro gauss fields that we are interested in. So you need a dynamo. Uh, this is the simulation. And this is like a small piece of the universe where you see these numbers are in, micro, in Gauss and this is like 10 to the minus 20 Gauss inside a galactic kind of region. This is a simulation by uh, Gnedin Ferrer. So the basic idea of the dynamo also uses some concepts from the flux freezing. For example, suppose I take a flux tube like this and I stretch it. Then, uh, then what happens, the flux, Magnetic flux is B times A, area is the cross-section area. The density, the mass in this flux tube is rho A L, rho is the density. Most of the motions are incompressible. I divide these two, area cancels out. And B by rho is proportional to L. So the more I can stretch these flux tubes, the more I can grow the magnetic field, provided rho does not change. And if you have incompressible, nearly incompressible motions, rho does not change drastically. So basically, every time you randomly, if you have turbulent motions, for example, then turbulence lead to parcels of the fluid randomly walk, random walking, and you can lead to a random stretching. Stretch it in one direction, you grow the field. Stretch it in another direction, you grow the field. Now, this is a multiplicative process. So you go by a factor of two, then go by a factor of two, suppose. Then you'll get two to the power n. And this leads to a dynamo. This is called a fluctuation dynamo. Many of us, including Amit, I've been very interested in this, but it does not produce very coherent fields. To get coherent fields, it seems that you need to do something other than just have turbulence. One of the things that you seem to require is some kind of helicity in the, in the turbulence, something which breaks parity. Okay? And it turns out, but this fluctuation dynamo grows things on the ter eddy turnover time scale. So it grows in the galactic context, if we take 100 parsec, and 10 kilometer per second as a random velocity, you get a time scale of 10 million years. It will turn out that the mean field dynamo grows things in a very much slower time scale, the rotation time scale. So you get a lot of noise before you get a coherent field. So one of the problems which we have to deal with is how to make this co field coherent in the presence of all these fluctuations. I'll come back to that. The other interesting question is that you will find that when the mean field dynamo grows the field, you'll automatically get large scale links of the field. For example, you'll, you'll get phi component of the field and radial components of the field and they link. And that's something called magnetic helicity, such links. And there is a nice conserved quantity in ideal MHD, which is the magnetic helicity. So how do you get these magnetic helicity out of nowhere? So these are the two things which I'm going to focus upon. There's just a picture of what you get from the fluctuation dynamo. I've just taken one representative simulation by Pallavi some time back. And you can see these are the Z component of the fields in the three phases of this cube. The flow is driven on the scale of the box and you see highly intermittent fields here. Something remarkable happens when you force the same box in a helical way. So this is a simulation by Axel Brandenburg where he has forced turbulence on the scale 115, the scale of this box. And you see all kinds of noise out here. And then eventually as you wait in time, you find nice, very ordered, what are called Beltrami fields, sines and cosines in this box, in the different components of the box. So where does this order come from? And, but it turns out this order because of this magnetic helicity conservation, which I'm going to talk about, 
comes on a very slow time scale, which is equal to the resistive time scale in this box. And in a galaxy, the resistive time scale is bigger than the age of the universe. So there is also a problem to deal with here. So where does that order comes from? So <clears throat> here I'm going to take the induction equation. First, I'll do it mathematically, then I'll show you some picture. The induction equation, suppose you average in some sense. So you have these random motions, random fields, and you want to look at some mean field evolution, the coherent field evolution, which is a field average on a scale, which is much bigger than the scale of the random motions or the random field. So you average, let's say the induction equation, there was this V cross B term, which will give you two types of uh, averages. One is the average of velocity times the average of the magnetic field. There will also be average of velocity times average of the fluctuating magnetic field, which has averaging to zero. These are all represented by small b and small, small b. Similarly, there'll be a fluctuating velocity and average of field, which will also average to zero. But there'll be a non-trivial cross correlation of small scale velocity and small scale magnetic field. In general, this need not have been correlated at all because you can stir, make a turbulent velocity which, which has nothing to do in general with the small scale magnetic field. But in the presence of even a seed magnetic field, seed mean magnetic field, large scale magnetic field, the small scale velocity will tangle that large scale magnetic field to produce a small scale magnetic field. Now that tangled B because it arose from the small v, will be correlated with that v. So you will get extra portions to this, what is called the turbulent mean electric field, which are proportional to the mean magnetic field itself. Of course, then you can use some theory, some closure theory, say that there is maybe since if they have very big scale separation, that small scales are much smaller than the big scale, you can expand this turbulent EMF in its field, its first derivative, second derivative, keep the lowest order term, try to calculate these coefficients and find that the leading term, which also Bushin referred to as the alpha effect, depends upon the helicity of the turbulence. If you have a helical turbulence, then you can get a part of the electric field due to this turbulent motions, which is just proportional to the mean magnetic field. And you can see that in principle, if you have something proportional to the mean field, dB by dt with something proportional to b itself, you could in principle get completely exponential growth of the stuff. That's what happens here. You also get additional pieces due to turbulent diffusion, which just correct, this is the microscopic resistivity, you get a turbulent resistivity, which is more easy to understand. If you have some large scale gradient and you have turbulent motions, you still simply smooth out those large scale gradients if the field is frozen into that. But this is the non-trivial term the V dot omega. Pictorially, of course, you can ask where does this helicity come from? It turns out that any rotating stratified system develops helical motions if you start stirring it, even if you stir it initially non-helically. Because if you have some small eddies and they expand, they get a Coriolis force which twist them. And if they go contract, they get a Coriolis force which twist them in the opposite direction. But the expansion or contraction in a stratified medium, if they go up against stratification, they may expand, go down, they contract, but the sense of the helicity remains the same. So you get a net helicity in the system. As I said, supernova then can drive a galaxy, for example, stratified. It's rotating major, but there's a gradient in the vertical direction. There's a rotation in about the, about the center. So there is an omega, which is also in the vertical direction. There's an omega dot gradient, which, is, which can contribute and that can produce helicity. That helicity will produce this effect called usually called the alpha effect, produce an extra turbulent EMF, can grow the field by itself. In galaxies, you have an extra bit or even the sun, which can also help because you have differential rotation or velocity shear. In galaxies, it's much simpler because in the sun, it's controlled by all the turbulence that you have, the, all the complicated stuff with Professor Srinivasan and, and Shaban were talking about. But in the galaxy, there's gravity, which is the big boss, and it actually makes everything rotate in a very predictable way once you know the potential of the galaxy. So you know what is called the rotation curve. You can easily work out the differential rotation. 
And for example, if you took a radial field, that will get bound up to produce a toroidal field by just the flux freezing and differential rotation. This helical motion can take the toroidal field, spin it around and produce a poloidal field or BR components. These two working together will lead to exponential growth and will lead to growth on the time scale of the rotation. So this is the basic idea about the mean field galactic dynamo. Uh, Professor Bhattacharya, how much time do I have? Uh, you have, yeah, I was just about to say, you have about five minutes. Wow. Okay. So let me go rapidly through the two problems which I, which I wanted to. Five minutes for 30 minutes or five minutes for 25 minutes? 30 minutes. Okay, great. So the one problem is to do with helicity conservation. Here what you have is you have a tube you can imagine it's a flux tube, but Anwar and his wife Natasha actually took hose pipes from the garden. And when you do this kind of motion, when you do this kind of motion here, twisting, writhing, you automatically also produce an internal twist. For example, this has been writhed by 90 degrees and the white and the black has become black and the white. So what has happened is that these flux tubes behave like ideal magnetic fields and they conserve helicities or this hose pipe behaves like that. And because you try to produce links of the toroidal and poloidal components here, which has some magnetic helicity, it produces the opposite sign helicity here. And this will come back. Now, why is it important? Once you have a twist, internal twist, that's how it conserves helicity, it transfers helicity in scale, produces one sign of helicity in the large scale, produces exactly the opposite sign in the small scale. Once you have this, the small scale twist helicity has a larger Lorentz force because it's smaller in scale, the current is larger. And so J cross B is larger. So even if you have, if you conserve helicity, this has a much larger Lorentz force. That comes to kill the dynamo. If you, if you keep on doing this and you would be very familiar with this, if you have a, either a hose pipe or if you have had played with a telephone wire or if you have taken a bath with all these things which are coming, you know, twisted up. You keep trying to twist anything, after some time it becomes so strongly twisted, it'll untwist you in principle. So that stops the dynamo, unless you can get rid of these twists. How to get rid of such twists? Well, this is where you need to have fluxes of helicity. But remember, I said helicity is, is something related to twists and links and all that. So it's like a topological quantity. So how to define a density of helicity, how to define a flux of helicity was a major headache. And this was something which we sorted out at some stage. And we could even write down a helicity conservation equation, look at various kinds of fluxes. I won't go into the detail. It turns out that you can write down a gauge invariant helicity density as a density of correlated field links using the Gauss's uh, formula for curves, curves being interlinked. Among all the kind of complicated fluxes that you can derive, my friend Anwar convinced me that the simplest flux is one which just throws things out. When you throw out the field, you also throw out helicity. But of course, you should be very careful because you should not throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. So you need to throw out all the dirty stuff, but keep the baby, which is the dynamo. So we then have solved these dynamo equations, incorporating these helicity fluxes. For example, there is a advective helicity flux, which is just due to the velocity. And there are these advection possible because supernovae drive out gas out of the disk of the galaxy. There's also diffusion of the helicity possible which Druba has done some work on and determine what kind of coefficients are there for this diffusive flux. And we have now tried to get at all this by doing some closure models with Kishore. So you combine this helicity conservation and the dynamo equation, and you find that you can grow the field to a significant level. You can even get spiral structures like that, what we see there. Uh, this work for in Luke Chamundi's thesis with Anwar and myself. The other major problem, I won't get into this, is what about the fluctuation dynamo on the small on the mean field dynamo? As I said, the random noise is produced on a time scale of 10 to the seven years. 
but this large scale dynamo works on a time scale of 10 to the 8 or even longer time scale depending on the system so this also we have tried to get it in, through a lot of work which pallavi has done in a thesis through numerical simulations so this is spectrum what is shown here is a spectrum that is the amount of magnetic energy as a function of the wave number so larger the wave numbers the smaller the scale and this whole system was driven on the scale of one fourth the box so there is some space for things bigger than the scale of driving and some space for things smaller than the scale of driving and then we watch what would happen and this was given helically so it is true that initially you produce all fluctuation this power spectrum initially he speaked at large scale so you produce all these magnetic noise but it turns out as the field grows the lorentz forces manage to order this field to produce some power on the scale of the box itself how exactly this happens in in analytical kind of closure models or understanding it properly is still an open question not only that in more recent simulations of pallavi she has also found that you can get some evidence for both types of dynamos that is there is initial growth of the magnetic energy due to the fluctuation dynamo and then a further exponential growth which is slower growth rate due to the large scale dynamo so i will not get into this testing turbulent transport coefficient and let me wind up i just wanted to convey that uh, the universe is magnetized and it's still uh, a very important interesting problem that uh, you need batteries of course and there are a lot of people who are thinking about different types of batteries and one of the earliest large scale battery uh, was invented with uh, chitre and narsimha uh, with their help by my, me and chitre and narsimha which is the bearman battery and dynamos are simply required to amplify and maintain the field there are very open challenging problems for young people to still look at one of the problem is how does dynamo saturate and i spend a lot of time on this but it's not a solved problem at all by any means how does the fluctuation dynamo saturate and amit has written a nice paper on this and uh, i am sure that he will agree with me that he still it's an open question and how does the large scale dynamo saturate how does it overcome this fluctuations how does it overcome the helicity problem and then putting all this together so i have concentrated on the basic conceptual problems here rather than actually showing you big scale simulations which will actually do everything but it's a very interesting problem and i think it will be open for young people to look at the last thing i want to say is that we always have been probing this field through radio astronomy in fact i think somebody asked me how do you probe distant galaxies and he was talking about rotation measure the very simplest probe is synchrotron emission if you see synchrotron emission that means there's both cosmic ray electrons and magnetic field you don't know how ordered it is you need either polarization or faraday rotation but nowadays other avenues have opened up one of the important avenues is far infrared uh, astronomy which involves dust emission and dust polarization and surprisingly gamma ray astronomy and also gravitational wave astronomy so all these are all opening up and there are a lot of interesting exciting things i always talk to kumar about many of these things we never wrote anything together but we always spend time talking about this thank you very much for your patience and i am happy to take any questions either now or later Professor Jayanta, you are muted. You need to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. You got muted again. <laughs> Professor Jayanta, you got muted again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Subramaniam, for. Uh, a very interesting and broad overview of uh, the subject and uh, we have a question uh, this is from debesh uh, it says that uh, the negative sign of turbulent emf in the mhd equ induction equation seems to go against time evolution of b uh, because of the sign so how does it help in the growth of b 
Oh, no, no, no. So you would, I, 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 oh, I stopped my, I stopped my, uh, it doesn't matter. I have written everything under a curl. So actually I have a curl of, if you do look at the resistive term, it's a curl of minus eta curl B. So when I expand that out, I'll get gradient of divergence of B, which is zero and minus del squared B. So that minus eta comes with a minus del squared B. So it becomes plus del squared B. So it's a positive <laughs> diffusion. So it's nice to write everything in, inside a curl because uh, or then you look at all the terms in a similar way. I mean, it's, people expand it out and then it looks like a mess, but actually it's a very nice expression inside the curve. And so the turbulent diffusion also comes with a minus tau average V squared by three, which also adds to this eta. So it also is a plus turbulent diffusion del squared of V. Nice, thank you. Uh, anybody else who has a question can raise their hand and go ahead. Uh, we don't seem to have anybody uh, right now, so thank you again very much and uh, we shall now then pass over to the next lecture. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. So um, we uh, will go on to the next talk, which is by Professor Dubadit Gomitra from uh, Nordita. And uh, actually the first paper that Dubadit ever wrote uh, as a PhD student was uh, very significant. Uh, changed things around in, uh, about the question of time um, multifractality, but today he'll be talking about something quite different, uh, surface signatures of subsurface magnetic fields, the signature written on stellar atmospheric waves. So, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, let me share my screen first. So, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, actually, let me do it in a different way now, just for a moment. So this one, where is my, did my Zoom go? Zoom is mysterious. Uh, share screen, screen, yes, good. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm ready. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Still? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I'm actually really very pleased. I'm deeply honored to be invited to this meeting. I'm also particularly pleased because some of the students of CBS that I have worked with before, for example, Rohit Sharma, are also speaking in the same meeting. My thesis advisor, Rahul Pandrit, spoke in the earlier session. So I feel like I'm seeing lots of old friends after a long time. I'm very pleased to be here. But before I start discussing science, if you allow me, I would like to make a few opening remarks. As Jayantada said, I started my career as a physicist in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, working on turbulence. Stupidly, during my PhD, I was blissfully unaware of the infinite possibilities of application of turbulence to astrophysical problems. Now, in my second postdoc, I turned to astrophysics. I went to Queen Mary College in London to work with Reza Tava Cole and Axel Brandenburg. And one of the first questions Reza asked me was, how is Kumar? Which was followed by an incredulous remark, you do not know Kumar? And soon I realized practically every astrophysicist, every astrophysicist in Queen Mary, starting from Ian Roxborough, deeply admired Kumar Chitre. Unfortunately, I never got to meet Kumar while I was in London. My opportunity came when he visited Nordita at Stockholm in 2013. So what you see on the screen is our group photo from that time. You can see me just behind Kumar. You may also recognize Axel Brandenburg who is here, 
Bent Gustafsson, and maybe some of you know some of the other people in this photo. From 2013, I have been in touch with Kumar off and on for last 11 years. I visited and lectured at CBS. I was privileged to be invited to his home. Unfortunately, although he had an open invitation to visit Nordita whenever he pleased, he never managed to visit us again. Last time I met him in person was in Cambridge in 2019. To my regret, we never wrote a paper together. I'm going to make a very short comment on Kumar's achievement as a scientist and an administrator. Several other speakers far more equipped than me has commented on these aspects. He made fundamental contributions to several aspects of astrophysics, ranging from neutron stars to solar physics. What I would like to particularly mention is that he belongs to the generation of scientists who built Indian science after independence, sometimes making significant sacrifices to their own scientific careers. Umar was particularly exceptional among them for his emphasis on teaching and trying to build the future through the CBS. And what I have seen from the CBS students, this investment in future has worked really, really well. Not only us, the present generation of Indian scientists, but also the country in general, owe a lot to Kumar and other people like him. I would also like to quote from the book of abstract of this meeting, a statement I particularly agree with. He was an embodiment of modest refinement and culture with a heart of kindness and empathy. While preparing for the talk, I read the reminiscences in the book of abstract this morning. I also read in social media what several of my contemporaries, particularly Susan Conner wrote. If there is one central theme that comes out of all these reminiscences, and I particularly recommend the one by Ahai Astekar, it is Kumar's unfailing kindness and encouragement to the students and younger colleagues. Now, before I turn to science, I will make one more comment. I do not know about you, but I find it difficult to concentrate on science while COVID ravages through India, taking our loved ones away from us. I am glad that the last time I met Kumar, I told him how much I love and admire him. This is something we very rarely do in our culture. My advice to the young people who may be listening to this lecture is, please tell your near and dear ones how much you love them. Turning to science, I'm going to talk about a topic that Kumar introduced me to, magnetoseismology. Last time I met him, this is the topic we talked about. I am going to deeply miss his advice in the future works in this field. I particularly like talking about this topic because one of the topic, one, this is the topic that me and Kumar talk most about. Two, one of the CBS students, Proful Kumar, some of you may know him, did his master's thesis project with me on this topic. The work I'm going to present is done jointly with Bindesh Tripathi, who is one of the most promising young astrophysicists of his generation. Being true to Kumar's spirit, I will try to be as pedagogic as possible. My target audience is the advanced undergraduates, for example, students of CBS in their final year. So if you are even a casual observer of the natural world, you will notice that waves play a predominantly large role in it. We sense the world through light and sound waves. Even the sensory signals in our nerves are electromagnetic waves. Now, physicists are particularly obsessed with waves, so much so that some of us even, conf even confuse them with particles. Now, JBS Halden once said that God has an inordinate fondness for beetles. The physicists have an inordinate fondness of waves. So among such waves, light waves are possibly the simplest because they emerge from fundamental equations of Maxwell's equations, which are linear in nature. But the more common waves, the one that you see as ripples on the surface of a water body, they are actually the far more complex ones to understand. So they typically emerge from linearizing some nonlinear equation. And one of them, that is the simplest that I will going to talk about in a moment is the Alvin waves. But before that, uh, we are, I'm not going to talk about waves in water or liquids. I am going to talk about waves in plasma. Plasma is often called the fourth state of matter, is the most common form of matter in the universe. And the plasma experiment or the realization of plasma near you is probably the tube light in your room. 
So the thing inside that that glows is plasma. There are charged particles of both sides in the plasma. But in the approximation that I am going to talk about, you can consider the plasma to be charge neutral. That means the two charges are well mixed. You can imagine that because the electrostatic force is one of the strongest forces. So the what matters is not the electric field, but the magnetic fields. Now, here it's possibly useful to quote from Feynman, who says perhaps the most the fundamental equation that describes the swirling nebulas are the condensing, revolving, and exploding stars and galaxies is just the simple equation for hydrodynamic behavior of nearly pure hydrogen gas. This is absolutely true. Except with one addition that I would like to make is that it's actually dynamics of plasma. It's the plasma that is really everywhere in the universe. So with that introduction, let me go one more step ahead. Uh, so to talk about the plasma, let me first introduce the equations. Now the modern trend in lectures is to avoid equations as possible and to rely on pictures as much as possible. But from my experience in CBS, when I talked there several years back, I realized the students there are not afraid of equations. So I'm going to inflict some more equations on them. So the first one that you see is this one, uh, del T of rho plus divergence rho u equal to zero. Rho is the density, u is the velocity. This equation, the continuity equation, essentially is a statement of conservation of mass. The next one is a statement of conservation of momentum. See, rho u is the momentum. This is the advective term. Next is the pressure, the gravity. And the one that is outside is the j cross b term, where j is the current and the b is the magnetic field. This is the additional problem because we are dealing with the magnetic field. And the third equation, the equation that also Kandu mentioned several times, is the induction equation. Of these three, it's the middle one, which is the nastiest. That's the nonlinear one. And there are two nonlinear terms. This is the first, and this is the second. So when you deal with water waves, for example, you don't deal with the last term here or the induction equation. You deal with the quantities within this rectangle. But the water waves are actually a very difficult example of waves to deal with. So I'm going to talk about a little bit the simplest waves that astrophysicists deal with, this is called the Alvin waves, which is particularly appropriate for me to talk about because Alvin is one of the few Swedish Nobel laureates. And I now work in a building which is in the Hans Alvin way. Uh, so let's start with this equation. So as I said, the way waves emerge from nonlinear equations is that you linearize them. So there is a background velocity u0, there is a background magnetic field B0, and there is a background density rho zero. I add small perturbations to them. I substitute them in the equations and I expand. I expand and I keep up to first order in the perturbations. Then I will get a set of linear equations. After that, I expand, I expand my perturbations in a Fourier series. So I say delta u is some u tilde, exponential i omega t and i k dot x. I do the same thing for the magnetic field and for the density fluctuations. With this Fourier transform, my linear equations, which had derivatives and type in space and time, will turn into an algebraic equation, which will look like a matrix, which will typically look like a matrix like this. You can consider a column vector, which consists of ux, uy, uz, rho, bx, by, bz. And all your differential operators have turned into this matrix with certain omega and k dependence. So typically, you can write it as some operator m, which is operating on a column vector psi, and the right hand side is 0. So the solution exists when the determinant of m is equal to 0. This is quite straightforward. So if you now think of this, the determinant of m will give you an equation algebraic in omega. 
it will actually be an equation which is an eighth order polynomial in omega because you had eight such things. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, actually seventh order, sorry. That's my mistake. Okay, so you will get a seventh order polynomial out of this equation. So to give you, to show you what it looks like, let's look at the simplest example. I consider a magnetic field B0, which is pointing along the Z direction, and this is constant. I consider a background velocity that is zero. I consider a background density that is also zero. And I look at waves that are propagating only along the Z direction, which is the direction of the magnetic field. With this simplification, my Connected, my equation for determinant m equal to zero will become particularly simplified. You have to work this out, but once you do, you will find there is one root omega equal to zero, and then two roots which satisfy this equation, omega squared minus CSS squared k squared equal to zero. And you realize these are the sound waves, and the CS is the sound speed. And there is a fourth order equation, which is omega to the four, minus twice V a squared K squared omega squared plus V a to the four K to the four equal to zero, all total seven roots. So this equation you can write as omega squared minus V a squared K squared whole squared equal to zero. So you see, these are also equations which tells you that omega and K are proportional to each other. These are linear dispersion relation and the V a is essentially the magnetic field divided by density and mu naught, which is the permittivity of vacuum. So these waves, so these are the sound waves and these waves, these new waves that emerge because of the magnetic field, they are the Alphen waves. You can think of them as if the magnetic field is like a string and you perturb them and the waves propagate along the string. The one important difference that they have from the sound wave is that sound waves are longitudinal waves whereas the Alvin waves are transverse waves, but their dispersion relation is still linear. Now this is quite standard. Let's now make the problem slightly more complicated. So we now still have a magnetic field, but the plasma is gravitationally stratified. So there is a gravity acting vertically downward. So the density is a function of the vertical direction. The magnetic field is uniform. The problem seems simple enough, but once you try to work it out, you will realize this is quite a difficult problem. So far, even this problem has never been solved in its full generality. If you only study the waves propagating along the magnetic field, then it turns out that the solution of the wave equations are hypergeometric function. Okay, that's nice. And that's kind of lovely to those of us who obsess about hypergeometric functions. But on a greater point of view, why do we care? That's the important question. So we care because of something called magnetosismology. So the heading is actually taken from Kumar's lecture in Nordita in from 2013. So you see, we can observe both the magnetic field and the velocity on the surface of the sun. It is not enough to observe them from Earth because the fluctuations due to the atmosphere spoils what we want to see. But there are satellites that observe the sun all the time. We have very detailed observations of what is happening on the surface of the sun. Now, by studying the waves on the surface and ignoring the magnetic field, we can calculate the flow inside the sun. This is the topic that is known as helioseismology. Now you also realize that this is an inverse problem, which is always more difficult than solving the direct problem. For example, if I tell you what is the flow and the density inside the sun, and I want you to calculate what is the dispersion relation of waves on the surface. Keeping that comment aside, can we find out what is the magnetic field inside the sun also by a similar technique? This is what we are driving at. So if you look at the left, I show a picture from a paper from the group of Alexander Kosovichev, who looked at the fluctuations on the surface of the sun at a point where active regions emerged. 
and then they looked back in time and calculated what the waves looked like on the surface a day before the active regions emerged. And the idea is that although you cannot see the magnetic field in the surface yet, there is an emerging flux in the bottom. And once the waves pass through them, they get perturbed and the dispersion relations of the waves change. If you then calculate what is the behavior of the waves on the surface, you may be able to invert and find out what is the flux that is lying below. This problem was never solved rigorously, and but to solve the problem, you have to solve the direct problem first. What is the surface signature of a subsurface magnetic field? But I have just told you that the problem that has been solved with quite a bit of difficulty is the one where you have a constant magnetic field. But we are now going into a more difficult problem where the magnetic field is small on the surface and large below. It is increasing as a function of depth. <clears throat> How much time do I have? You have 10 minutes. Excellent. OK. So I hope I was clear till now. So at the moment, let's say, we are looking into the problem where we are looking at a plasma, which is vertically stratified. Now, the simplest way to describe such a plasma is to make the isothermal approximation. That is, of course, not realistic. And I will talk about other things in a moment. But for the moment, stay with the isothermal approximation. We start with the equations of MHD. We linearize them. And then we eliminate the equations of the magnetic field and the density. And at the end, I end up with an equation for the velocity field, which you can see here. You see, it's a second order equation in time. And it's quite a bit of complicated expressions on the right. Let me walk you through them. Among the quantities here, there is rho naught, which is a function of z, because we are considering a stratified medium. There is gravity, which is constant, which is the simple thing. You see here divergence u. If, you are, if we are considering incompressible flows, we could have ignored that. But as we are interested in sound waves and their changes, we have to keep this term. And then you see there are two there are terms here, which are the gradients of the magnetic field. These are the terms that were missing in the work that has been done before which assume the magnetic field to be a constant. At the moment, we have assumed that the magnetic field is an exponential function of depth. So these terms are also exponential. And then you have few more terms. Okay, So it's quite a bit of a complicated equation, but you can work through it. And once you do, you can turn it into an equation like this. So it looks simple. Here you see the first equation, this was a partial differential equation with three components of the velocity. We have eliminated two components and landed up with an equation which uses only the z component of the velocity field. The d is the operator d d z. So we have a second order equation with a function f of z here and a function r of z here. This is in in principle, depending on what this f and r are, this can be quite a bit of a complex equation. There are various ways to deal with this. For example, most people, including me, once they see such an equation, they open their Bender and Orsag and look for WKB. And that's what I did. And that's what I told Bindesh to do when he started working with me on this problem. And Bindesh, being Bindesh, came back and told me he found an exact solution. That's quite rare in this business. But when it happens, you really rejoice in it. So the trick to find the exact solution is to make a substitution. So you introduce two more quantities. So you see, this function f of z and r of z, they contain functions which are exponential. Okay. So there is a trick to convert these exponential ones into an algebraic equation, which is a substitution like xi and w. 
Once you do that, this one turns into the equation below. This, as you recognize now, is the hypergeometric equation. So once you have the hypergeometric equation, life becomes simple. You can calculate the omega k diagram. You can calculate the dispersion relations, which is an example of the dispersion relation is something I show on the right. You can see the black dots are the dispersion relation, omega on the vertical axis and wave number on the horizontal axis. When I don't have any magnetic field, I'm sorry, those are the red stars. Then for a very small magnetic field, which in some non-dimensional unit is 0.01, you see that the dispersion relation has changed really very little. But once the magnetic field has become large enough, and in non-dimensional units, it has become one, your dispersion relation has changed significantly. Now, this is of course, this of course assume that there is a certain dependence of the magnetic field with the height that you have to assume. And there is a peak value of the magnetic field that you have to assume at the bottom. But with all of that, you can, one thing that clearly comes out of the calculation is that there is a clear change in the dispersion relation depending on what the magnetic field is. Now, this is of course for isothermal atmosphere, which is nice, but not very useful if you want to think about real problems. A much better approximation of the real sun is the polytropic atmosphere. So we have also done a calculation for that. If you are, I just to kind of tell you what it involves, there are some things you can see if you look here, it's quite a nasty bit of calculation. But more importantly, our Bindesh's exact solution did not appear here. So he had to come up with approximate calculations, which he did. And what we plot here is what are called the ring diagrams. So you stepping back a little bit, let's think about the problem for a moment. So we had three dimensions, the Z direction, the X and Y. In the Z direction, we had stratification. So things were function of Z the rho and the b were function of z. So we did not Fourier transform along the z direction. We Fourier transformed along the x and y. And then we obtained the differential equation where this d operator existed, which is the ddz, right? So now if you look at the dispersion relation, omega will be a function of x and y. Now in the absence of the magnetic field, the problem is symmetric in x and y. So if you take a vertical cut, you will see rings in your dispersion relation. And these are what are called the ring diagrams. Now, because of the magnetic field, your rings, which were circles, are going to turn into ellipses. So that's how your ring diagram is going to change. And that's what we show here. The unmagnetized polytrope has these circles, the black circles that you see here. And the magnetized polytropes are the red ellipses. The magnetic field is not very high. It points along the horizontal direction here. On the screen, it points along the x direction. And you can see the ellipses that emerge. So the ellipses are slightly squeezed in the y direction and slightly pulled in the x direction. It is, it's not, I don't have time here to talk about further details. I just wanted to emphasize the result and to give you a little flavor of how we arrive at them. So to to conclude, we can now calculate how the presence of the magnetic field changes these so-called P modes. To say that, I have to step back a little and tell you in a moment what the P mode is. See, you can again imagine that the dispersion relation is a seventh order equation, your polynomial equation that you need to solve. Now, among these seventh order ones, you can say that some of them are important because of the gravity and some of them were there already and they were important when their pressure is important. So the pressure modes are what are called the P modes. And these are the one that we are going to, where we looked at what happens to the P modes when the magnetic field, when we introduce a magnetic field. So for such a case, we can calculate how the presence of the magnetic field changes the P mode. We have an exact solution for the isothermal case and we have a perturbative solution for the polytropic atmosphere. For an introduction to the MHD equations, I strongly recommend Arno Brajodhuri's book, The Physics of Fluid and Plasma, an Introduction for Astrophysicists. 
For magnetoseismology, there are three wonderful papers. Each of them, the first author is Nishant. Axel is this, there in all of them. And then Kumar was also there in one of them. I think that's the first paper in this field that Axel and Nishant wrote. So Kumar's influence on this field is already clear. For waves, particularly for the kind of tricks that we have used, I recommend this paper by Tolstoy, which is in Reviews of Modern Physics. For inverse problem, there is this set of lectures that I could not emphasize more. If you haven't seen, seen these lectures, I, you haven't lived a full life. These are lectures on inverse problem by Joseph Keller. I strongly recommend them. For WKB and perturbative methods, now of course, all of us know about the book by Bender and Orsag, but there are also for the younger generation, YouTube videos by Carl Bender, which are really and truly wonderful. I put the link here. Thank you for your time. I am ready for questions. Thanks very much, Duraditta. That was a very clear presentation, really. Uh, there is a, a question from uh, uh, Sanskriti Karnava. The uh, Mach number uh, that is M sub A, the Mach alpha and Mach number. Absolutely and right. Then, then it is that if it is so, if M, this equal to zero implies zero velocity, uh, what is the significance of this particular uh, situation? So it equal to zero means basically zero magnetic field. So if you look back, see, this is the Alvin velocity VA. And the Alvin velocity divided by the sound speed is the Mach number. It's the, it's the Alvinic Mach number, not the Mach number in the usual sense. So it equal to zero implies the Alvin velocity is zero, which means the B naught is zero. So that's the Alvinic Mach number, not the Mach number in the usual sense. It's not the flow velocity divided by the magnetic field. It's the Alvin velocity divided by the sound speed. Correction, this question was from Debesh, so that uh, should be yeah, needed to be clarified. So if there is anybody else who wants to ask a question, uh, raise the hand and uh, there doesn't seem to be any and we are running a bit late. So uh, let's thank, uh, we all thank uh, Tubadita for a really lovely presentation and we'll go on to the next. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much and I thank the organizers for a wonderful meeting. So, so we are um, about to start the final uh, talk of the session. Uh, it's by Professor Katapalli Srinivasan from New York uh, University. And uh, um, uh, for obviously, Professor uh, Srinivasan will be talking about, uh, as the title suggests, convection, convective turbulence, uh, which is a huge part of his uh, repertoire. Uh, but for those who are the younger members of this, I would recommend uh, that if they look back into one of Professor Srinivasan's papers in 87, which essentially started off uh, multifractality in uh, at model building for multifractality in turbulence. It's absolutely essential, uh, lovely, understandable short paper, which does a great deal. So, Professor Srinivasan. Thank you, Jenta, very much. Um, I want to speak a little bit about uh, studies motivated by convection in the sun. And uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to pay respects to Professor um, Kumar Chitre's uh, memory. Um, I'm uh, not from uh, Chitre's orbit, um, nor was he in mind, so to speak. Um, so I should explain to you uh, why I'm here and why I'm so privileged to speak about uh, my work at this meeting. Um, 
in uh, somewhere late 1990s, I gave a seminar in the Jawaharlal Nehru Center in Bangalore, and he gave one too. And he, he spoke about convection in the sun. And during that meeting or after, I made certain promises and things I could do to answer questions that are appropriate to the convection in the sun. And the statements I made have been haunting me for the last 25 years or so. And I mostly want to tell you in what sense they've been haunting me and what kinds of uh, things uh, we've been able to do. I also want to say that he was at my seminar on polymers and this is a subject he was not supposed to know too much about, but he probed me very gently in ways that I appreciated a lot. So in fact, it is in completely in keeping with what I have known about his personality. So what was it that uh, Chitra talked about at that uh, seminar? It was about convection in the sun. I just took this from my web somewhere. So that's the sun, um, that round object. This is a cutout in the sun. And the core part of the sun, uh, maybe about 25% or something like that, is where the temperature is so high that fusion takes place. And the energy uh, travels outwards. And the fusion stops around, uh, around say, this boundary. And then the energy is transmitted in this part of the sun by radiation. But as you move outwards around seven tenths of the radius of the sun, uh, radiation is not strong enough to, uh, to transmit the energy. So uh, it happens that convection sets in. Convection is the bodily motion of the fluid uh, from one part of the floor to the other part, as I, I is indicated in this sketch, it actually is a thought to be in this form, a very uh, cyclic um, cellular motion, although it is much more complicated than that. And it is this part of the sun's dynamics that Chitra was talking about, and uh, this extends from seven tenths of the radius to all the way to the surface. Right on the surface, you can actually make observations through satellites and telescopes and things like that. And we know these very cellular patterns that are formed. And that part near the sun where observations and then simulations have been made seem to have been understood pretty well. And the laboratory experiments have basically not contrib contributed much to it. But it is the part of convection underneath, underneath that where direct measurements are, are very limited. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about them. And where simulations are very hard to make because the parameters are very immensely large. And experiments are simply out of the question for reasons which you will see. And therefore, uh, we have a very indirect knowledge of what happens there, and, but that is the part that I would be interested in talking about. Now, um, uh, to tell you uh, the reasons for what I will describe, I have to tell you about the naive views that I held in late 90, mid 90s on the convection in the sun, which is, the, which is how I communicated to Chitre my, my views. First of all, the so-called Rayleigh numbers in the sun, which is just the driving parameter, are very large. Um, and I will make some estimates later on. So the flow should be highly turbulent. I think this is the uh, conventional wisdom. And if the... Um, convective flow is highly turbulent, the temperature gradient in the bulk of the convection region, which is what I'm uh, interested in, would be very small. And the standard mixing length ideas should work. And then the mixing length calculations actually show that the temperature gradient is very close to adiabatic uh, value and differing uh, from it by something like one part in a million except very close to the bottom and top of the convection layer. So the non-adiabaticity effects should not matter a lot. 
Secondly, the mean flows are very weak and the turbulence is only due to buoyancy and not caused by shear instabilities in the mean flow. This is what I mean by weak. And the heat transport is insensitive to whether the boundary conditions are constant heat flux as it happens in the sun. If you think of the bottom and top of the convection layers, uh, uh, which is where the energy uh, enters and um, from the core, uh, from the radiative zone and then out into the atmosphere, or constant temperature of the sort that everybody is fond of studying in this field. It's called the so-called really Bernard case. The molecular Prandtl number in the sun is of course small. Uh, in fact, I'll make a big point of this. But at that time I thought uh, it doesn't really matter because the flow is a turbulent uh, case. And when you have uh, high levels of turbulence, then uh, molecular properties do not matter all that much. So those are the views I held. And so my conclusion at the time was, if I want to understand solar convection, all I have to do was to study rayleigh bernard convection at comparably high Rayleigh numbers and perhaps rotate it because sun is a rotating object. And then if I know the answers to that problem, I would be more or less directly be able to tell what happens in the sun. Now, of course, that's a very limited view, it turns out. Um, uh, but I want to tell you uh, how uh, the story evolves in, in my case. So why, uh, why I was confident about doing those things at the time was we had already submitted a proposal to the National Science Foundation. We asked for $20 million to create an apparatus that will have Rayleigh numbers that will almost overlap with those in the sun. And so, well, we would know, uh, we would know uh, all about it. But as uh, wisdom um, um, shows, they gave us only a quarter of the money we asked. And therefore we built a smaller apparatus and compromised um, maybe by three or four orders of magnitude, the uh, Rayleigh numbers we had wanted to communicate. So that's in 1997, we have this book, which really is a supplement to the proposal that we wrote. And uh, we got that money, as I said, in part, and uh, I went about uh, my own business of doing experiments and uh, in, inferring from them. But Chitra's conversation was always in the background uh, for maybe something like a dozen years. And then they came to the foreground when I started uh, collaborating with uh, Sravan Hanasoge. And uh, the first, one of the first things we did uh, with Sravan was uh, this paper which showed that if you uh, do helioseismology with Bruba talked about, and he used the so-called time distance method, and you plot uh, the spectral density of the east-west velocity as a function of the spherical harmonic um, degree here. The very famous numerical simulations called ash simulations, analastic spherical harmonics thing, so that gave us spectral distribution like that. But Sravan's helioseismology, which really uh, one imagines is the real thing, actually showed uh, this uh, bottom curve. Actually, not exactly that, but this is a really revised uh, since then, slightly revised from 2012 to 2021. Nevertheless, the trend was the same. And then there was this, um, this other method of tracking granules on the surface, which is not exactly the same, but uh, we'll probably tell you a little bit uh, similar. And you can see there's a huge difference between simulations on the one hand, uh, typified by this calculation, and uh, the, the seismology results uh, here. The difference is uh, one order of magnitude in the velocity or in the energy, maybe two, two, one and a half here, maybe two and a half, three orders of magnitude in energy. So that really bothered me enormously um, at that time. Not only was the magnitude itself uh, was bothersome, the ash simulation sort of agreed more or less with the conventional 
mixing length calculations. So in fact, uh, it had some sense of reality to them. And this also is supposed to be real. So there is something that was not quite uh, right. What was more bothersome was the fact that the, tr the trend was uh, very different. It, the, the simulation showed a lot of energy at uh, low wave numbers and the actual seismology results did not. Now, it, during that time, actually comparisons were not made in a, for the, exactly the same quantity. They were analogous quantities. Later on, uh, Hota calculated for us uh, certain quantities which we could measure um, uh, directly. Uh, again, uh, seismology, in this case, using a different uh, technology. And the, the essence is the same. This is seismology result and these are the simulations. And these are two different depths. And um, so what is clear is that there's a depletion of large scales in, uh, in um, the seismology results compared to simulations. So this is uh, how I got really interested and, and got uh, to worry about uh, directly interpreting the results uh, for the sun, the laboratory results for the sun. And that's what I will try to describe. But first, uh, because uh, as Dhruba and others have pointed out, there may be students who don't know much about this. I'll tell you what uh, the experiment was, uh, at least schematically. So here is a container has a diameter D and the height H, and you maintain the uh, bottom plate, which is highly um, conducting uh, at a temperature delta T larger than that at the, uh, the top. So bottom and top plates are highly conducting and uh, the, the sides are insulated. That is whatever heat you put in at the bottom just goes through the fluid out um, uh, through the top plate. So here is a fluid sitting and it has a certain properties, thermal expansion coefficient, kinematic viscosity and thermal diffusivity. And so the question is uh, for uh, different values of delta T that you maintain between top and bottom plates, how much heat is transmitted through the fluid from the bottom to the top? And what the temperature distribution is inside this apparatus? Now, if the temperature difference is very small, the heat transport is completely by conduction and the profile is a linear, a linear one. The temperature varies linearly between here and here. If the delta T in some normalized sense increases beyond a certain critical value, then the fluid begins to move itself and starts to transport the heat because the molecular motion cannot do that anymore. And uh, this um, uh, can be really very simple uh, even uh, when delta T is just above the critical value and can become turbulent when it's uh, larger. And that's the one that uh, really we are interested in and that's what you think happens in the, in the sun. So uh, the delta T that we talked about is measured in terms of the so-called Rayleigh number. So it's delta T here, acceleration to gravity, alpha, you know, h is the height, you know, nu and kappa I already given. So this is, a, this is the forcing uh, for this problem. And uh, the fluid has this material property. And then I want to ask how much heat is transported and the heat transport is measured in terms of the so-called Nusselt number, which is simply the heat flux divided by what would be possible by conduction alone. And uh, so the problem is posed as, if I give the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number, how does the Nusselt number change as a function of these parameters? There might be other parameters, for example, the ratio of D to H and whether it is a circular thing or a hexagonal thing or, and things like that. But I'm just going to worry about that uh, as, uh, as they appear in my talk, but let's talk about this first. So in fact, uh, if you plot um, uh, lo logarithm of the Prandtl number on this axis and logarithm of the Rayleigh number on this axis, many of the, um, uh, the experiments and simulations we did uh, covered uh, this range um, from 10 power minus three in Prandtl number and there are simulations that go up to 10 power three and uh, experiments here and things like that, but the sun 
is uh, it lies here. I just use the big blob because in fact the numbers are variable. And uh, here is uh, the parameters, really number very large and parental number very small. So um, that's the one that we want to understand. And so how do all these things actually help us understand that a little bit? Um, now in the experiments, I, I said we covered um, uh, large Rayleigh numbers from 10 power 6 to 10 power 17, something like that. And parental numbers 10 power minus 3 to 10 power 3. So you think that might be very large. In reality, in uh, real situations, things are actually much, much broader. So the real number can vary from 10 power 5 to uh, say 10 power 24, whatever, the sun being the object of interest, it might be much larger in other stars. The parental number can vary by some 30 orders of magnitude, let's say 25 orders of magnitude. So in fact, uh, if you are a physicist, you would like to know what the convection uh, patterns are um, when you vary the parental number or a large magnitude and the really number or a large range as well. In fact, the flow changes very drastically as you vary, for example, uh, the Rayleigh number, the flow becomes more and more turbulent and you can imagine what they will be like. But when you vary the Prandtl number by about say one out of magnitude, you can see the structure of the field, temperature field is very different. Here is very, very fine and very diffuse here. So there are big differences in the, in the convection patterns when you vary this. So what does the theory say, or what did the theory at that time say? There was this theory by Malkus and Spiegel. Actually, Malkus was the originator. Spiegel made a commentary on it, 1954, uh, plus meaning later years. And yet Spiegel, who uh, wrote this paper commenting on Malkus's thing, he also came up with this coefficient in front. Essentially, what it says is Nusselt number is really to the power one third with a known constant and no parental number dependence at all. Now, there was a competing theory that uh, came into being, uh, Kraken theory, and Spiegel also contributed to that. And uh, that came a little bit later. And um, what it said is Nusselt number goes like really to the power half with the parental number also included. And uh, this is called the so-called ultimate state or the asymptotic state, because these are calculated for conditions as viscosity and thermal diffusivity go to zero. Now Spiegel actually pointed out, uh, not very uh, sophisticated uh, observation, nevertheless, the first one to say that these exponents are sufficiently far apart from each other one must be able to differentiate between them. And at that time, uh, we had no clue at all. And what does the experiment say? That was part of the motivation for the experiment I uh, talked about. So here is uh, the Rayleigh number and the Nusselt number uh, plotted on this log log plot. And the measurements were made by Joe Nimla, Ladik Skrebek, and uh, Russ Donnelly. Russ is no more. But um, Nimla and Skrebek are 20 years uh, older. Um, so uh, here you have the data plotting on one simple line, uh, which is a power law, I think it's a log log plot. And uh, the fit is, uh, is something like that, really to the power 0 0.32, very close to one third. And we have no coefficient that is well known or well uh, uh, quantified. Now, uh, the important thing is, uh, as you increase the Rayleigh number, here is where uh, we want to be. If we were going through to the sun, we would have had to extend this by a few hours of magnitude, uh, two or three hours of magnitude, let's say. Um, I was not so worried about it because the behavior seemed very simple and you can extrapolate it. Um, and... Uh, uh, so it looked like everything was under control, but uh, papers in search of this asymptotic state kept coming. And one paper, for example, um, in 2012 claimed that after a certain Rayleigh number, the 
power law exponent went from 0.33 to 0.38, and it agrees with the asymptotic state. Um, well, I mean, it's not quite conclusive. It's not half yet. And uh, in fact, uh, this paper pointed out that that says spurious effect. And uh, this paper by Charlie Doring said, uh, never mind the physics, just take the data and uh, fit the data uh, properly. And uh, the claim is not, um, not valid. Nevertheless, whatever it is, uh, um, let's say the authors uh, st still stick to their views, all of them. I was getting worried. And so we did these simulations uh, with um, Karthik Iyer, uh, Janet Scheel, and Jörg Schumacher. And what we tried to do was to simulate the flow to the highest possible Rayleigh number. Because we tried to use the biggest computer there was. Even so, we could only use a slender cylinder like this um, because the Rayleigh number depends upon this dimension. And if you expand this in this direction, you need more grid points, it becomes very hard. And so here is a large number of grid points, three times 10 power 10. Nevertheless, that's what we were able to do. And I will tell you what the effect of this constraint is. Uh, in any case, when the Rayleigh numbers are very small, the boundary layers on these top and bottom walls are very, very thin. And the horizontal constraint is really not that critical. Uh, that's how I argued for myself. In fact, these are the temperature fields at uh, different um, um, uh, Rayleigh numbers, 10 to the power 9, 11, and 13. And we measured the Nusselt number as a function of Rayleigh number expand, extending by about 10 hours of magnitude or so. You get these data. And if you want to know whether it is one third or not, you take the Nusselt number and divide it by Rayleigh to the power one third and plot it on this axis, Rayleigh number. And for low Rayleigh numbers, it's a different power law, two sevens, as was very well known for some time. But after a certain Rayleigh number, it seems to settle down to one third power. So that's, uh, I thought it was uh, quite conclusive. And uh, so just comparing with the Malkus's formula or Malkus Spiegel formula, um, the helium, ex helium experiment formula, and the present experiment, which is uh, given here, Nusselt Rayleigh really to the power one third is uh, 0 0.053 or something like that, really to the power one third. Although the coefficients are not exactly the same, it seemed, it's, a, it's amazing that they were in fact very close to each other. And uh, especially given that a little difference in the power law index when the Rayleigh really number changes by many hours of magnitude could cause slight differences in the prefactor. So that's where it stood. And now let's talk about, that's a Rayleigh number effect. And uh, now let's talk about the Prandtl number effect. The Prandtl number in the sun is very small. Here is a uh, Prandtl number log to base 10. It's 10 power minus six, uh, approximately all the way through from the bottom of the convection region, almost to the top where it sort of uh, falls uh, rapidly. And that is not exactly believable because uh, because uh, it's a partially ionized gas and uh, it's very hard to um, keep track of it. And the Prandtl number is very small because the moment of transport is uh, done by electrons and heat transport by photons, unlike in uh, say uh, um, classical fluids at room temperature, things like that, where it's the same uh, molecular motion that uh, produces both effects. Now, uh, in order to do that, we spent some time trying to do the simulations in the same slender cell, varying the Prandtl number from uh, say a few times 10 power minus three, uh, all the way to a few times 10 power two. So that's a large enough range. Nevertheless, it is not as small as what it is in the sun, uh, but you can uh, begin to extrapolate once you know um, uh, the trends. So uh, you do this for different Rayleigh numbers, 10 power eight, nine, 10, and 11. And you can see that this varies with, um, with this exponent varies with the Rayleigh number. And you plot that um, as a function of Rayleigh number, you plot this exponent. You see, there are many different types of exponents for low Rayleigh numbers. 
but when the Rayleigh number exceeds a certain value, it's uh, flat, uh, approximately 0.17, something like that. So in fact, the formula for uh, Rayleigh-Bernard convection for large Rayleigh and small pronto is this. This is now uh, uh, experiments from uh, simulations, let's say in this case, solving uh, full equations. So you have that. Now, uh, another effect is as you vary the Rayleigh number, um, you measure the Reynolds number of the flow and you get these curves for different parental numbers. And these and other data sets can be um, collated to give you Rayleigh no Reynolds number as a function of the parental number. As the parental number varies by some six sorts of magnitude or so, you can see that the Reynolds number varies as well. And uh, so as the parental number goes down, the Reynolds number goes up. And uh, this is the relation. It's a relation that uh, you can uh, establish through simulations and things like that. You can do a little bit of rotation. And uh, here is the rotation on this axis. Trust me number, if you prefer that, uh, goes, goes like that. That means the rotation increases in this direction. And this is the Nusselt number divided by the Nusselt number without rotation. You can get a small diff, uh, variation with respect to rotation, at least for these cases. So the Rayleigh number is still high and the so-called Taylor number is also very high. And uh, this rotation is not uh, big enough. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the sun, uh, that's where the sun as a big blob might lie different aspects, for example, granules might lie like that, super granules and uh, different properties depending on the scale. And what is plotted is one over the Raspi number that is larger the value, higher the rotation. And you see uh, laboratory experiments are all concentrated here. Whereas you want to go several orders of magnitude on this axis to reach the sun. Uh, the highest uh, data, highest Reynolds, Rayleigh number data is ours. Although it doesn't get that far, it is the largest there is. I mean, so I can tell you something about, about this. Also interested, uh, we were at the aspect ratio. As I said, sometimes in simulation, they're small. Sometimes uh, um, experiments also, they're not very large. And we did an experiment with, uh, with uh, aspect ratio four that is squashed in the vertical direction compared to the horizontal direction. And um, I will I tell you the flow is somewhat different from low, um, low aspect ratio things. Nevertheless, the uh, heat transport does not vary at all. So in fact, at this point, I could say to you, uh, I'm in a position to say the effect of uh, Rayleigh number, Prandtl number, rotation, aspect ratio, et cetera, uh, if you take everything on faith that I have said, well, I should be able to do that. But I can't tell you exactly what happens in the sun uh, because the uh, sun is still a very different object, um, not a Rayleigh Bernard uh, convection. So I can say it's probably like this in the sun, it's probably like that, and probably not like this, and things like that. And that's what I will do. Now let's look at the Prandtl number effect. Uh, here is the um, here is the. Oh, would you remind me when I'm ten minutes uh, into my uh, end of my talk, please? Thank you. So sure, sure. yeah, uh, here is the um, is the convection apparatus. Uh, let's say this is the height, and this is the temperature. This is the bottom plate, top plate. The temperature varies very much in the boundary layer, very much in the boundary layers here. In between, there is this gradual variation, which varies as you increase the Rayleigh number, this gradient becomes smaller and smaller. This is the Rayleigh number effect. But if you vary the Prandtl number, what happens is that if you start out with a profile like that, um, which, is, uh, which is, let's say like that, and then if you, to decrease the Prandtl number, the profile becomes closer and closer to being a straight line. So this, at this Prandtl number and Rayleigh number combination, this is almost like conduction profile. In other words, if you decrease the Prandtl number, 
the effect of turbulence somehow diminishes and you have the importance of the molecular effect uh, setting in. Now, so in fact, you can calculate what it is for the sun. You can take the known uh, thermal conductivity and um, you know what the uh, temperature difference is calculated from uh, stellar evolution calculations. And then you actually measure or estimate what fraction of the transport, thermal transport is done by conduction alone. In fact, right at the bottom of the convection region uh, is of course entirely conduction. And the thought is that the conduction becomes really unimportant or becomes very small as soon as you step into the conduct convection region, but it doesn't, it sort of does it in, an, in a very gradual fashion. And even at um, 0.8, which is uh, this far uh, from the bottom of the convection region, 9% or so of the convection uh, radius, uh, sun's radius, uh, it's still about 20%. So in fact, here the turbulence effect must be small if these calculations are right, which means that it is a kind of relatively stable region, which is where I think things like Rossby waves and so on can be created in a stable fashion and can be sustained. Otherwise, it's very hard for me to understand how, for example, in a very turbulent environment, you can create such, a, such a very well-defined waves. It may be like that. Another thing is that the, um, although the, the, the not only is the Prandtl number very small in the, in the sun, but it also varies across the radius. Uh, so it is a certain value at the, at the bottom of the convection region, and then it changes gradually and becomes very precipitously uh, changing at the, at the top of the convection region. So in fact, you can do simulation. This you cannot do in the laboratory. At least I don't know how. So we did the simulations of this with uh, variable thermal diffusivity. And the thermal diffusivity, this is now the uh, height of the convection layer from zero, that's the bottom plate. And this is the top plate. And if everything was symmetric, that is, there was no uh, variability of the molecular properties across the depth of the convection region. The profile, as I have already said, will be like this big drop in the boundary layer, hardly any drop in the major part of the convection zone, and then another drop at the other boundary layer. Now, if, you, if the Rayleigh numbers are smaller, it's the same effect. Uh, but it is uh, it is a little bit less drastic than than here. Now, if you have a variable thermal diffusivity, simulations show that, uh, in fact, the drop might be um, will be highly asymmetric between the two boundary layers. This one here at the bottom, not much at all, uh, not much drop, and then this has to precipitously drop. Therefore, the temperature in the bulk of the convection region is much larger than the mean value. Most of the distance, it is really larger than the, than the mean value, which actually means if the scenario is right for, for the sun, uh, I want to translate to what uh, might be, uh, what could be happening. So this is the bottom of the convection region, top of the convection region. Normally you would say that, well, uh, this is a constant temperature equal to the mean value. There's this drop in the top uh, layer, drop in the bottom layer, and then a slow uh, change in, the, in, uh, in uh, the bulk of the convection region. Now, if of course uh, the, uh, the thermal diffusivity is very small, then the boundary layers are very thick. And so there's a, a gradual, more gradual drop here, more gradual drop, and the same pattern, except for the thickness of the boundary layers. On the other hand, what is happening uh, with the variable diffusivity, it's not only small, but variable. Then you have an uneven, uh, unequal change in the, in the two boundary layers. So this and this are very different. And the mean temperature, that is the temperature in the bulk um, here is much larger than the mean value, which is this. So it is sort of always lying to the, to the right side of that vertical line. So this actually means the temperature distribution is very different. 
and um, uh, from what you think it has been. And I want to illustrate to you what impact it has. Um, this is from simulations. I, as I said, I can only infer what might be happening in the sun. It might be like this, it might not be like that kind of thing. So I want to say a little bit about the momentum, uh, about the diffusivity of uh, turbulence. Remember, initially I, I said the molecular parental number is small, but it really doesn't matter, I thought, uh, some 25 years ago, uh, because in turbulent environment, molecular properties do not matter. The transport is heavily done by turbulence. Um, is this uh, true or not? Um, so we have this variable parental, variable thermal diffusivity calculations, which also translates to variable parental number. So I have this parental number on this axis, which varies, as you can see, by some five orders of magnitude. The smallest value is uh, 10 to the power minus um, three, maybe three and a half, something like that. Of course, the sun is somewhere here. Uh, we can't go there, but if this, if this, be, if this trend is correct, then maybe I can extrapolate and start to infer something. So these are various runs. They sort of meander around a little bit, um, but the trend seems to be pretty clear in all of them. Um, the turbulent parental number, which is what is plotted here, and the molecular parental number, which is plotted here, uh, have this trend. Now, what is a, a turbulent parental number? Um, Turbulent parental number is a turbulent viscosity divided by turbulent diffusivity. So this is uh, how uh, turbulence um, diffuses uh, momentum by virtue of the fact that there are huge fluctuations or balls of fluids that move about carrying with them momentum. And then the, uh, the turbulent uh, diffusivity is a similar mechanism carried by parcels of fluid which are hot going from one place to another and, and things like that. Now, what this graph says, uh, whose fit I have uh, shown approximately here, the, the turbulent parental number goes like inverse of the molecular parental number. So the molecular parental number is very small as here, the turbulent parental number is very high. And by the definition of a turbulent parental number being this, what it means is that the, 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 uh, the momentum diffusivity, effective momentum diffusivity is very large compared to uh, the effective thermal diffusivity. So let's see what this means. What this means is that, suppose I start with uh, some fluctuations in both temperature and velocity at a certain time t equal to zero. Then, because the momentum diffusivity is very large, in very short time, a little bit later, the velocity fluctuations are all evened out because they're just diffused by this large uh, new T. Whereas the thermal um, uh, fluctuations have maintained their shape because in relation to new T, this kappa T is small. So in fact, you have an environment in the sun uh, all of this interpretation uh, subject to all of that is that uh, the momentum, um, uh, if you have a structure um, and the, it loses its momentum very rapidly to the neighboring, uh, to the surroundings, whereas it does not lose the temperature uh, that easily. So effectively what it means is that if I have, let's say at the top of the convection region, uh, plumes of, of core fluid that descend into the, into the bottom of the uh, solar convection region, then what happens is that these plumes will lose their identity in terms of momentum very fast, but in terms of temperature, that is a thermal plume, they will maintain their identity for very long. This is from some simulations and I'm not the originator of this idea. The originator uh, go back to Rempel and uh, Mark Mish and other people like that. But generally that's the idea. 
So the idea is this, this frontal number, which I thought was a very inconspicuous kind of thing because it's just a molecular factor in a highly turbulent environment through a combination of conditions, I come to the conclusion as to um, how turbulent it is at different parts of the convection zone and uh, what role the molecular frontal number can play, not only the molecular frontal number smallness, but also its gradient across the depth of the convection region. So that's the kind of thing that uh, one can actually deduce. And I don't want to give you one example after another, but I want to conclude by uh, stating uh, the following. Um, in astrophysics, principally it is about uh, celestial objects as they exist. Of course, there are evolution calculations and things like that. But basically, if you are most of the work on the sun, would be about what the sun is today, what its properties are and, um, and things like that. And simulations of the sun and tools like helioseismology, remember the important role Chitra played in, uh, in uh, uh, moving helioseismology forward in India and elsewhere as well. Um, uh, when these tools are applied to satellite and telescopic data, they will tell you about the structure and flow in the sun as, as the sun exists today. Um, they provide uh, extremely useful data specific to the object uh, being studied uh, clearly. In standard physics, the approach is quite different. One does controlled experiments and simulations in order to test the effect of a single variable on the system being studied. And such laboratory experiments and simulations are usually not possible for astrophysical parameter ranges. And so in fact, that is not a very common approach in, uh, in, uh, in astrophysics in general. The simulations that are performed, but they are all in a very different parameter space um, uh, compared to what you have in the real object. What I have shown is a kind of uh, struggle, as I said, um, uh, whose origins sort of go back to the claims I made 25 years ago with uh, Chitre to reach uh, such ranges as are appropriate to astrophysical situations, especially with respect to sun. And uh, from such studies do not tell you exactly what is happening in the sun, um, but you can only get answers which are in the spirit of similes, such as, well, the sun is like this, it's not like that. But the insight is probably helpful. I think that is a um, modest but accurate assessment uh, that I should make of uh, the relevance of this to the sun and other objects uh, which, which I have uh, worried myself. So this is um, all I wanted to say. I know that uh, you, um, I wanted to bring the program back to time. I hope that's been possible. So thank you again very much for the opportunity you gave me to talk about this work in honor of um, Kumar Chitre. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Professor Srinivasan. So uh, I don't see any questions in the uh, chat box. Um, but so uh, if there is anybody who would like to ask something, could raise a. Thank you and be safe. So it doesn't seem that um, there are any. Uh, Oh, Dhruvaditya did. So, Dhruvaditya Mitra. Uh, can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 I can. Yeah. So, near the surface, transport is dominated by radiation. Yeah. So, what the, the transport coefficients that you are talking about, the diffusivities, for example, are actually effective coefficients coming from radiation. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely correct. But as a boundary condition to the uh, to the convection, what I am saying is that the those properties just vary very precipitously near the surface. Uh, their origin is radiation. Yeah, I agree. And is it important to resolve the radiation, or is it enough to use the diffusive approximation to the radiation? Um, I don't know the real answer to this, but I believe it has been sorted out um, very convincingly. The papers that I have read from your colleagues like Nardlan uh, suggest to me that somehow that problem has been sorted out uh, very carefully. 
Thank you. Uh, anybody else would? Uh, one small uh, question uh, that uh, uh, it, uh, it seems from what you said that the exponent is one third very clearly. That, um, uh, the, yeah, that's uh, what uh, I would uh, say. Uh, that's what I would say. And there uh, is, yeah. of course, so, a but, group of people who don't believe that. Yeah, but essentially, one third means that the viscosity boundary layer is not having any role in the problem. It's uh, just the other way. I, uh, yeah, uh, well, it's just the other way, I would say. The boundary layers is really where the whole action is. And uh, you have uh, basically convection uh, thermal uh, uh, gradient. It is, are established. it is just the relay number d cubed, which is essentially doing the job. That's correct, yes. Yeah, so I mean, the viscous boundary layer is not really. Even I though the relay number uh, has the global dimension to it, yeah. Um, actually, the physics is such, it really implies that it is the boundary layers that are doing the transport. That's what Malkus had. Uh, basically, it is you have two length scales, and uh, one is the thickness of the boundary layer, the other is the height, and you have the limit where uh, the ratio goes to zero. Oh. And now, as it goes to zero, um, the thermal boundary layer, relatively speaking, becomes smaller and smaller. Uh, nevertheless, it is that's where the action is. Malkus's theory was about the marginal stability of the boundary layers. It just happens to come out uh, like the like the height of in the parameter, like the height. Um, but it doesn't matter. The real Rayleigh number that you want to calculate is based on the thickness of the of the boundary layer itself. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, all right. So uh, thank you uh, very much. I mean the as if there is nothing else, so this session comes to a close over here. Professor Jan, that... I have sent you one more question on chat box. I think it is by Professor Narsimha. Um, I can't see the chat box for some okay. reason. I will uh, tell it then. I, I can see what the chat box uh, is, but it, there's nothing on the chat box. All right, Professor. Uh, but Acharya, if you allow, I will directly ask it. Sure. Professor Srinivasan, if you take the distance 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, the radius of the sun, we know the radiative flux reasonably accurately. So yes. based on helioseismology, we can infer the Meset number, isn't it? Yes. So any yeah. model simulation should at the end uh, explain that Nusselt number. So isn't it true? Yeah, the Nusselt number is um, a ratio of two things. One is the uh, actual transport uh, by uh, turbulence or whatever else divided yes. by what would be possible by uh, molecular properties alone. Yes. And uh, the, uh, the denominator would be in purely convection problem would come from convection alone. But if you have radiation, you would have to put that in as well. No, no, that's why I'm telling we know how yeah. much uh, to uh, reasonably accurately, how much yeah. energy can be transported by radiation. Yes, this indeed. This has to come from by convection. And we know that the moment you go to 0.8 radius, the amount of radiation that can go by radiation is negligible. That's correct. Simply because we know the opacity. So That's in that correct. sense, between 0.7 and 0.8, That's correct. we know the set number reasonably is my view. So yes. in that sense, any of the realistic simulation, see what you are doing is a very good simulation. It is useful because, and then the thing is that uh, by putting in this set number, you can try to see what should be the other coefficients for the sun, isn't it? Yeah, um, this is what I did uh, with respect to uh, conduction itself. But you can add also radiation to that. And the radiation also doesn't stop exactly at 0.7 radius. It and it, uh, as you rightly point out, uh, becomes smaller and smaller. 
as you go out. So, in fact, there is a significant part of what has traditionally been believed as the convection region, where I believe convection is relatively weak. Uh, it's weak because some of the uh, transport is by radiation, some of it by um, conduction. And so, in fact, that is a region where there is not that much turbulence. And that's why I say it allows for you know, other uh, very regular features to develop in the sun, uh, perhaps like Rossby waves. And also this may be related eventually to how uh, you have regular features like the, like the sunspots. I mean, one of the biggest mysteries has been to me at any rate, uh, why in the presence of such huge turbulence activity characteristic of such immense Ray Rayleigh numbers, uh, you have such periodic activities um, or nearly periodic activities. I think it is all related to the fact that there are regions in the, in the sun where you think there is turbulence, but there isn't. I mean, this is okay, my, my inference. No, the thing and, is what uh, we have done is important, Professor Srinivasan, because we you, also do not know about the magnetic field, the, sun, the, Correct. the driving region, whether this uh, base of the convection zone is important. Because yes. since we do not know many of them, so if you can firmly say as an example, the check number yeah. versus yeah. Whether it Thank you. Uh, I will try to make that a little bit uh, firmer uh, with uh, time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So anybody else? So we can take another. Doesn't seem so. Um, so, uh, uh, just uh, what the, uh, the essentially in the middle of your convection, all almost all through your convection cell, the temperature is a constant. Somewhere, I mean, the drop and the rise, I mean, the uh, is all essentially in a zero layer situation near the plates. That's correct. Um, that is indeed uh, correct. But if the if the uh, result of simulations um, with variable diff diffusivity uh, is uh, is cor uh, correct. What it means is that the temperature is higher than what has been believed to be the case. I don't know how much more. And that explains to me uh, how um, thermal plumes that descend from the bottom sort of remain um, uh, intact somehow. So that's uh, my version of the, of the thing. Yes, you're right. But I will say that is not exactly equal to uh, the mean temperature, mean adiabatic okay, temperature, yeah. but it is something, yeah. something different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, so I, uh, since one hopes yeah, there's nobody else that I have blocked out. Uh, so would like to thank all the speakers of the session. And uh, with that, uh, when does the uh, concluding um, uh, session uh, start? Now only, please uh, don't go away. Okay, uh, I'll we, stay on. Yeah. We thank uh, uh, Professor Bhattacharya for chairing this session currently. And yeah. please stay back. We'll have the conclusion right now. Okay. So for I that, will, we'll, I will, invite, we'll invite Professor Susant Dattagupta. So I uh, request uh, my colleague uh, Amit Seta to introduce him and invite him. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Sapan sir. So thanks a lot, uh, Jan, Professor Jayanta Bhattacharya for chairing the last session. Uh, and uh, for the final session uh, will be chaired by Professor Sushant Kumar Dattagupta, who is an INSEA senior scientist at the JC Bose Institute, Calcutta. So Professor Dattagupta did his PhD from New York, then uh, postdoc from uh, CMU and uh, Canada, and then returned back and was at uh, various institutes in India. He, is also, he was also the director of uh, SN Bose National Center for Basic Sciences, and then uh, either Kolkata. With that, I would request uh, Professor Sushant Kumar Dattagupta to start the final, to chair the final session. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Amit. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. 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 Good. 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 So, uh, so we have come to the concluding session now of what has turned out to be a very intense meeting covering Professor Chitre's interest, deep interest in astrophysics and fluid mechanics. Uh, so before I start this concluding uh, session, 
Uh, I would, of course, need the help of uh, Dr. Swapan Ghosh a little bit in structuring this session. But just I just wanted to say one thing is that what came out during this, uh, this the three-day symposium uh, is uh, not only Kumar's deep involvement with uh, astrophysics and fluid mechanics, but also yesterday when we had the session on remembrances, uh, various speakers, um, mostly having to do with uh, CEBS and its inception uh, and the atomic energy support for it, uh, talked about Kumar's other involvement in institution building, which I think is a very, very important aspect, especially in the Indian scene where there are many hurdles, many difficulties. And as, I, as we discussed yesterday, uh, Kumar came from uh, one of the very endowed institutes in India, the Tata Institute, but then ended up uh, in, in a very modest situation where he was operating from, um, uh, you know, prefabricated structures, and but then he created an environment, an ambience, and I can see so many students have come forward to remember him is only because of his dedication and commitment to teaching, to education, to nurturing uh, people. Now, having said that, it was also clear. Uh, from most of the chairpersons of the session, as well as people who spoke yesterday uh, in the uh, remembrance session, is that uh, they mostly belong to the atomic energy and Bombay. I mean, either Tata, either uh, BARC or TIFR or Bombay University, uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, things like that. But of course. Uh, 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 yours truly was an exception, uh, but as uh, Dr. Chidambaram is fond of saying that once in DAE, you are always in DAE. Uh, I guess he was referring to my five-year uh, plus stint at Kalpakkam at the Indira Gandhi Center in the beginning of my career in India. So, uh, uh, but you know, uh, Kumar, Kumar Chitre's... Uh, uh, Sorry, there's some noise. So please continue. That was a mistake from Okay. So, but of course, you know, Professor Chitre's uh, dimensions, ex, you know, extended far beyond. Though he was a Mumbai car, as was pointed out uh, by many speakers yesterday, he loved Mumbai. But of course, he had other dimensions. And what has uh, not been so much talked about, because this is a physics symposium, uh, was his deep interest in uh, things other than science, uh, which are of course related to science, namely art, music, etc. His involvement uh, with the, uh, with, you know, with the, uh, at the Tata Foundations, and also uh, uh, his uh, the fact that he was essentially uh, in right kind of successor to the multifaceted personalities of people like Homi Bhabha and Vikram Sarawai, who, as you know, were not only great scientists, but also had uh, many other attributes. And so this is something that uh, we should also remember. Now, uh, I, uh, before we start the concluding session, I saw Professor Mukunda in the audience and he is also like me, once in DAE, always in DAE. So <laughs> would, would Professor Mukunda like to say a few words? Is he still there? That would be nice. It would be very nice, please. Professor Mukunda, please. Oh, thank you, Sushanta, and thank you, Swapan. I had not intended to say anything, so I've not prepared anything. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, impressed me most listening to all the talks and the special session yesterday is the personality of Professor Chitre. Someone mentioned yesterday, I think Professor Raghunathan, that his contacts with Chitre go back about 50 years. For me too, it, it is more than 50 years. It is from 1967, 68. We both used to live in a block of flats belonging to the TIFR 
in a suburb of Bombay, Bandra. And on so many occasions we have traveled by the suburban trains from Bandra to Kolaba and back. So I have known him from that time, that's what, 53, 54 years. And we had been in touch over the decades, even after I moved away to uh, Bangalore. He brought me in to assist him in my own way with the setting up of his center in Bombay. So I was attached to that for quite a long time. What came through about him as a person was the breadth of his interest, the depth of his interest, and the kind of person he was. Always so gentle, so polished, so accommodating. Uh, his passing away has been a great personal loss to me. That is all I can say. I hope that the center lives up to his expectations of him and grows in every way. Thank you for asking me to say these few words. Thank you, Professor Mukunda. Your extemporaneous intervention is as erudite as your very carefully prepared speeches and talks. So thanks once again. So um, uh, Swapan, I would now like to uh, invite Professor M.S. Raghunathan, who is a distinguished professor and patron of uh, CBS. I don't see him on the screen, but I'm sure he is around. We're not able to contact him. He's not picking up the call also. Oh, I see. Yes. So in that case, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Jaypal Mittal, uh, who, yes. uh, who is the chairman of the academic board of CEBS, uh, he uh, would like to make some concluding remarks. And also someone should do a conference summary, which I saw in the, uh, in the uh, declared manifesto of the program. Uh, yes. Jaypal. Thanks, Sushantu. Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that for the last three days, we had a feast of great science and an excellent meeting. At the outset, I must thank Professor V.K. Jan, the director of the CBS, and Dr. Sapan Ghosh. Professor Mittal. You are muted. Uh, uh, un please unmute, sir. Yeah, I will. Uh, now, now we can yeah, hear. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Shall I start from the beginning? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that for the last three days, we had a feast of science, a great science of astrophysics and fluid dynamics. Where at the outset, I should thank Dr. Jen, director of the CBS, and convener Dr. Sapan Ghosh for this excellent meeting. All colleagues of the CBS who have been in the organizing committee and who have with great love of and respect for Professor Chitre who organized this meeting in these difficult times. Well, any symposium depends at the speaker's choice. That is which kind of speakers are going to speak in this and what kind of topics will be discussed in that symposium. And as you, can, you must have heard in the last three days, Wonderful topics, entire range of topics, which are all common theme was, they were all related to Professor Chitra's interest, whether it's gravitational lensing, solar flares, solar physics, cosmology, neutrinos, LIGO, entropy of black holes, white dwarf, gravitational memory, quantum entanglement, magnetic field, geometric, geometry, or geometry of dynamics, any branch of the astrophysics, which is what well, complete interest of Dr. Chitre. He was completely involved in that apart from the, of course, education was his number one. And I would say astrophysics is number two. It, it was such an important issue for him. And speakers, to get such a great list of wonderful list of speakers and uh, that as like Professor Christopher Tout, Lord Martin Rees, Professor Douglas Gouge, Subir Sarkar from Oxford, Cambridge from Caltech, and Professor Kip Thorne, Sri Kulkarni, Kulkarni, who gave a very wonderful and provocative talk, and from the New York University, from Australia, from Switzerland, from Sweden, and, and many, many students of Professor Chitre who have worked with him. It was really a wonderful feast, in my opinion. But anyway, any good things have to come to an end, and this is the time where we would 
enjoy and remember these three days which you have spent here with such a wonderful new science and com coming out all the time and trying to, many people will say, well, what is the relevance of astrophysics? Why you should do research in astrophysics? There's the clear cut answers. If you want to listen, you listen to all the speakers of today and any meeting in order to be successful requires large amount of effort. And all these efforts were done by all the students and the faculty members of CEBS. So my thanks, personal thanks at the same time, thanks on behalf of all the people who have listened to the seminar, to all the volunteers behind the curtain, especially many of them who are working continuously for days and nights and they have been preparing for this meeting for last I guess at least three months, day in and day night, because these are very difficult times. We were always hesitant. We don't know how the Wi-Fi will work, how the electricity will work in these days, how the COVID will behave. So in all these difficult situations, the volunteers of CBS and the many, many student volunteers who have worked behind the scene for making the meeting a great success. In my opinion, uh, students make the part of the whole CBS because they are the center point of all the things and we all work for them. And this is fantastic that things which we have learned from Professor Chitra is that any institution is basically meant for students and we should be taking everything which is good for the students. And thank you very much for arranging such a wonderful meeting. Thanks, Sushan. Now, Sushant is muted. Well, thank you, Jaipal ji. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, the host has spotlighted your video for everyone. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, Dr. Jain, who is the director of the Institute, and he has worked uh, so hard for, uh, you know, uh, bringing this symposium into fruition with uh, organization of everything and giving leadership. So, Dr. Jain, I now uh, invite you to make a few remarks. Thank you, Professor Sushant Datta. And good evening to all of you. When uh, Dr. Sapanda and uh, Bhushan and uh, Samved approached me sometime in middle of March with the proposal to have a, a symposium, an in, international symposium in memory of Professor Chitre. I was rather a bit shaky. The reason being to be shaky that there was hardly seven weeks time to have the symposium and the kind of technological involvement required, we were not confident enough, to be very frank, because we have started this year for the first time online lectures. So we did not have any experience that these online symposia and uh, seminars will work so wonderfully. So, but we must take challenges. How shaky we are, this should not matter much. We should accept challenges and we accepted the challenge. And I'm really very, very grateful and thankful the whole team of CVS, Sapanda, Bhushan, Samved, and all the members of the organization team, they have really worked very, very hard and meticulously planned the whole program. The people from one end of the world, from Australia to the other end of the world in California in America, the whole spectrum is covered in such a way that it was convenient to all the speakers of the respective time zones. I should not forget the student manpower. These student like uh, Shanshkati, Chansekar, Pratyush, Atif, Vish and Vishal. I could see these names. I, I'm sure many more must be around. And uh, they have really worked very hard. And I'm really thankful and grateful. And uh, 
I'm also thankful, of course, uh, Sambit or Bhushan will give a formal uh, vote, propose a vote of thanks. But from my bottom of heart, I thank all the invited speaker, plenary lectures, the special uh, plenary lectures by Nobel laureates, uh, Professor Penrose and Kim Thorne, and many other uh, six plenary lectures and uh, a lot of invited lectures, nearly 24. Unfortunately, only one could not do because of he suffered from COVID. So otherwise, the whole program went as per the plan. And most important thing, all session chairs see to it the, pro, the whole session complete in time. So it was meticulously planned. Each and everything was done in such a way that we could conclude and complete all the sessions in a time-bound manner. And we also thank all the scientists, professors, and senior colleagues uh, who have spoken about Professor Chitre in Reminiscence on yesterday morning. It was a wonderful experience. And everyone had really very, very, very encouraging and positive uh, remembrances. And also have a very high host from CVS. Certainly, we will keep Professor Chitre's expectations and the expectations of all the colleagues to maintain high standard of science education in CBS in the future to come. <clears throat> and with these few words, I thank all of you once again. And I also thank our mentors, Dr. Mittal, Professor Nal uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Jain Nalikar, and Professor Raghunathan. They have been a, a strength for us to support and guide in, in difficult times, whenever we encounter difficult situations. And uh, of course, the scientific content, as Dr. Mittal said, is very, very high. Of course, I do not understand uh, uh, the astro astrophysics aspects, but the, the way they were presented, I could get the feel, the kind of content uh, and, uh, and science discussed is of very, very high level. And I'm really, I was really happy to see the former student, Amit Rohit uh, Aklan, uh, uh, to, uh, doing so well and presented so well. Uh, actually, I, I, I kept my, uh, this video on mute, but I was seeing all, all the presentations and uh, they have done wonderful. And once again, I thank and I request all the people, whenever this COVID is over, please do visit CVS and uh, get a first-hand uh, information uh, and feel uh, from CVS. And with these few words, I thank all of you. And Professor Gupta, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Jain. Uh, I, uh, I would like to say that when, uh, during my, 10-day stay in 2018 when I was giving a set of lectures at CBS, um, I very strongly discerned that while the spiritual and academic guru uh, was Kumar Chitre, Professor Chitre, the actual uh, ground level workhorse was none other than Dr. Sopan Kosh. He was organizing all the lectures, he was meticulously doing things at the infrastructural levels. And he had this such a strong contact with the body of students. And, uh, uh, you know, in this very informal way, as you know, his personality is exactly orthogonal to Professor Chitre's. But the two complemented each other in such a nice way. So it's my great, great pleasure to invite Swapan Ghosh to say a few words now in this concluding session before I go to the uh, go to the our our wonderful students. Thank you, Shrandada, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, good good evening to everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm thankful to uh, all the CBS members who have uh, really worked hard and cooperated to the fullest extent. Uh, uh, so that has been a great. Uh, thing for us and 
most valuable is the uh, student volunteers. Uh, I'll just take the names. I may forget somebody's, but uh, Guru Sahib, Chandrasekhar, Sanskriti, Batsal, John, Kelvin, Joy, Tarun, Atit, Bardhavan, Sayad, Vishal, and Pratush, Anju, Anushka, Aswini, Gaurav, Jov, Kartik, Prithivitos, Sandeep, Subhajit, Jas, Gayatri, Nivedita, Avni, Saket, Manasmith, Vidit, Tanbi, Rajrishi, uh, then some of the students are also deeply involved, like Sambit, and so on. Uh, I might have forgotten somebody's name, please excuse me. But everybody, everybody has cooperated in, in uh, all possible ways, and they have done a wonderful job. Really. Then uh, uh, Sanbed and uh, uh, Bhushan, of course, they are part of the uh, assembly. And uh, Professor Antia also has contributed a lot. He has uh, given all his help. And uh, our ex-students were ready, to, uh, immediately accepted our invitation and came, Amit, Rahit, and Aklant. And uh, I, another person I am very grateful, that is Professor Subhi Sarkar, because we were trying to contact Professor Roger Penrose and uh, were not able to contact. And finally, we, I approached him and he really helped me to uh, get his personal email and uh, we could contact. There was just one week or 10 days back. So, uh, so many people, I really, uh, in all possible ways, they have helped. And uh, of course, I learned a lot from the conference. Conference, uh, some brief summary will be presented by my colleagues, Sanbed. And uh, I learned a lot, like, for example, I understood that uh, fluid dynamics, how it, uh, earlier I was uh, not really knowing how it can be used in astrophysics, where the distances are in light years, whereas normal fluids, fluid dynamics is where the distances are uh, in angstroms. So we have nuclear fluid dynamics, electron fluid dynamics, normal uh, fluids, and now astrophysical fluid. Dynamics. So these length scale, uh, like multi-scale modeling or bridging the link skills, that's really great. Uh, of course, I've learned a lot about uh, many, uh, some aspects of astrophysics also. So that will be covered by uh, Sunbeads, so I'll not mention, particularly gravitational lensing and uh, um, black hole, etc. Okay, so uh, with this, I, I think, uh, uh, and all the speakers, I, I thank all the speakers and also all the chairpersons and particularly the audience. So many uh, students registered. Actually, our registration was something more than 2,000. So many of them joined and it was really wonderful to see uh, young students uh, joining and uh, attending this conference. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kapan. Thank you also for organizing along with Dr. Jain and, and Professor Mittal's help. It's such a, such a nice symposium. Uh, as uh, all of you have said today, even earlier, that ultimately uh, this institute, the, the center, would be known for its students. I mean, what the alumni do, uh, how they spread out all over the world to carry the message of this institute, which has been a wonderful experiment of trying to embed a, dis a research-oriented educational institute within an already existing university setup. And so when I was visiting CEBS, I was struck also by the enthusiasm of the students. I mean, one name that has been already mentioned, whom I'm going to invite soon is, uh, whose name is tantalizingly close to another name which comes over the television screen very often is Sambit Mahapatra. I'm talking about uh, the other name, which is uh, Sambit Patra, but anyway. So Sambit Mahapatra has been, uh, he was around at that time when I was visiting and many other students. I probably didn't meet uh, Bhushan, but I also, of course, saw uh, uh, Pratush Bhatnaga and so, and so many other students. And they were actually, um, I think it's partly it's because of Bombay which is, I think, I consider it as the most cosmopolitan city in the whole country. And therefore it, it, 
it creates that atmosphere. And the students were very inquisitive in the class. They had no inhibition in asking questions, which I enjoyed. And this is what uh, Kumar Chitra encouraged. And also that in the evenings, they would take me out in the Bandra Kulra complex. It's a lovely restaurants and all that. So this was a very nice experience. And so now, Sapan, is it all right? Because I don't see Professor Raghunathan back. Mm -hmm. So is it OK that I go to some bit now? Yes, it's OK. Uh, so, uh, Sapan, would you would you now kind of uh, ask some bit? I think uh, to some bit, some bit. Okay, so to make a few remarks about the conference. Yeah, yeah. some bit can you? Yeah. So, thank you, Professor Dutta Gupta. So, on behalf I, of I'm, all I'm the sorry, I, I confused you with some bit, uh, Mahapatra, but don't don't bother, don't mind. Ah, no, no, it's perfectly fine. Yeah. So on behalf of all the members of the organizing committee, I would like to thank all the esteemed speakers, including the Nobel laureate, the plenary uh, sessions, and the invited talks, and the ex-CBA students for taking time out from the busy schedules to present wonderful, stimulating talks in the fields of expertise, and also share their most fond memories and reminiscence of Professor Chitre during their talks. These talks spanned over 12 sessions, gave deep insights into various topics, starting from solar physics, involving but not limited to solar neutrino oscillations, heliosismology, sunspots, fluid dynamics of the interior of sun, radio emission from corona, convection processes, to name a few. We also had engaging talks on topics such as the magnetic field of white dwarf stars, tidal effects in stellar binaries, and exoplanets. Moving from the topic of stars to that of galaxies, we heard scintillating talks on galaxy evolution, radio galaxies, jet from radio galaxies, magnetic field in galaxies, and dynamo actions. Exciting physics of the phenomena of gravitational lensing of, gravitational, uh, of galaxy clusters, then lensing from supermassive black holes, ultra strong lensing, and picture of the black hole using the event horizon telescope were presented. We also had a fascinating general lecture on the topic of cosmology, our universe, as well as specialized talks on the Big Bang singularity, alternate models of evolution of the universe and inflation, uh, and loop quantum cosmology near the Big Bang. We further had interesting and vibrant talks on gravitational dynamics, geometrodynamics, gravitational waves, the gravitational wave detectors all over the world and in India, then the gravitational memory and the symmetries of space-time. The ever exciting and mysterious topic of black holes, the nature of different type of singularities, physics near the event horizon, and the black hole information paradox were also elucidated. Then we heard brilliant talks in the field of fluid dynamics, fluid turbulence from multiplace flows to convective flows, nonlinear plasma, MSD waves, partially ionized plasmas, astrophysical dynamos. This was indeed a unique opportunity to learn from the world's best experts, and we believe everyone attending, including the students, has gained a lot from the symposium. We also thank all the chairpersons for conducting the sessions in a wonderful and efficient manner, balancing the time and also the interest of the speakers. We also thank the 2,500 participants for actively participant either participating in either Zoom or YouTube sessions. The guidance and support received from members of the Governing Council of UMDA CABS, members of the Academic Board, the patrons, has been instrumental in the success of this three-day symposium. We greatly appreciate the presence and the kind warm words of all the distinguished dignitaries, formal colleagues, family members, friends, well-wishers of Professor Chitre during the remembrance session of the symposium, and or sending their remembrance messages, taking time out from their busy schedules. We also thank all the members of the technical committee, web, conference, web conferencing committee, finance committee, CVS administration, and technical staff for contributing their much helpful part in the symposium. And special thanks also goes to the student committees who has really worked hard to make this event successful. So thank you. Thank you very much, Samvit. So, Sapan, uh, who would now like to speak to you now? Bhushan, would you like to speak? Bhushan. Sir? Yeah, Bhushan. 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 No, I think it's fine. So, Ved has already summarized, so I think it's fine. Okay. No, no, but you, you say well, something. The difficulty is at different levels. 
Yeah. No, no. I think everyone cooperated. I mean, uh, of course, as uh, as as the as uh, Professor Jain said, that we did not. Uh, I mean, earlier we were a bit apprehensive, but uh, yeah. as we started going, we built the confidence. The way everyone came in, uh, it was like uh, it's like uh, what we call it as collective effect in plasma. So everyone came in, and uh, we we could do it. I think we should thank everyone. Yeah. No. Can I ask? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bhushan. So uh, I uh, saw yesterday uh, Professor Raj Sekharan. Uh, again, uh, you know, he was in the Tata Institute at one time and colleague mm -hmm. of Professor Chitra. Is he still there, Rajaji? No, oh, he probably is not there today. Anyway, so we're we're still uh, well within our time. So would anybody else like to say a few things in conclusion? Can we invite Amiya? Yeah, Amiya is here. Yes, I'm around. Yeah, can uh, you like to say something in the conclusion? Uh, no, not really. Everything has been so beautifully summarized by Professor Ghosh, Professor uh, Jain, and some then some way then uh, everybody. So I really don't have to say anything. It's it was a brilliant conference, absolutely a brilliant, brilliant conference. Very well done. All the students of, in particular, Sapanda and uh, Samvid and uh, Bhushan have done a brilliant job, and the students. And I could sort of see them that they were <laughs> really around for all the twelve hours, and that is highly non-trivial. <laughs> Mm. So I, I really don't have much to add. So I, I'm just, I just would like to thank all of them to put such a thing together and uh, to all the mentors and uh, the patrons for making this uh, even a reality. It was brilliant. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amiya. Thank you very much. So no, can you invite Vivek Yeah, sure. Vivek, are you here? Vivek. Vivek Dattar? Ah, okay. Hi. Can I say uh, yours? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, of course, I was, uh, I mean, the symposium has gone on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, but, yes. Yeah. Uh, Can you put your video on? Video. Yeah, I should put on my video. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I think but the symposium went off very well. And uh, you had really, I mean, a, a whole range of uh, talks, right from... Uh, to Nobel laureates, to you know, very senior people who have worked in the fields, but also very importantly, the students from CBS who are uh, who, who are doing very well in uh, in the places where uh, you know they're doing postdocs. Or, so I think one of was probably even a faculty. If I remember right, maybe I'm mistaken. Yes. But uh, uh, I mean, I had association with the very first batch. I think it was the eighth or ninth semester or something. There was some special course in nuclear physics that I gave. And uh, one of the students, in fact, gave a talk here. Uh, what is his name? Sharma. Uh, you know, Rohit Sharma. Yeah, that's right. Because Rohit. I remember the cricketer <laughs> by the same name. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I remember that, uh, you know. And uh, at the same time, I also remember whenever I used to come to class, I used to come usually about 15 minutes early. And quite often, I would uh, peep in the room of uh, uh, Chitre, Sometimes he would be there, sometimes he wouldn't be there. But whenever he was there, I would, uh, you know, have a quick chat with him. Or uh, I used to take actually, I think, something like four hours lectures. Because I told him that, uh, I mean, I'm working, I'm an experimentalist. Sometimes I go for experiments in Pelotron, TFR, and so on. So would it be okay if I took uh, Saturdays, uh, you know, one and a half hours each with a break of about half an hour? Uh, and uh, they agreed. And so in between, I would sometimes again uh, go back to. Chitre and would chat. He had, a, I think, a couch or something in his uh, room, if I remember right. And uh, a very pleasant personality. Very, uh, I mean, that, of course, everybody else has said soft spoken. I also had another occasion to, you know, uh, ask him about, uh, you know, something else, uh, some help for INO. Because he had, you know, he knew people in various circles, Nehru Center, uh, Council, or whatever. And he, uh, we were at that time, we had got a suggestion that we should ask some, you know, one of the politicians who was uh, 
creating a problem in Tamil Nadu, that we should get to him through a senior politician in, uh, in the country. So he, uh, he enabled us to talk to a senior politician here. And then we went to Delhi, sought in, I mean, we were looking for meeting that gentleman, but somehow that didn't happen. But anyway, this politician from Maharashtra, he actually called us the next day, hoping that we'll meet with. So anyway, this all was worked out because of the intervention of Professor Chitre. So he had other, you know, uh, uh, connections, which uh, we were fortunate to be, uh, be able to use. Of course, but finally it didn't turn out to be a success because the politician that, uh, that we were dealing with was a very clever politician. So he somehow didn't want to meet us. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the, the other occasion, of course, was, uh, you know, uh, I, I said that I have this, this exciting uh, result and uh, I would like to give a seminar. So he said, oh, no problem. So in fact, I have given, I think, two seminars in, uh, and both of which he attended uh, right from the beginning to the end. And as, I think after the colloquial, there was also a lunch or something like that. And uh, uh, I mean, the interactions with Professor Chitre were extremely pleasant. And uh, so... Uh, but also, I think the ambience there, uh, in, so far as the teaching and students, and especially the lab, I, I, I've also seen the lab of uh, Nagarajan, and uh, really beautiful. I mean, the, the, the kind of things that have been going on there, I think that's a, it's, it's a model for maybe other institutions. Uh, I don't know, how, I have not interacted so much with ICER or NICER, but this certainly is very different from uh, many of the places, including IIT. So, uh, Professor Chitre has built up a very nice institution and I hope this continues. And uh, I hope also that all the big institutions here uh, really uh, cooperate and uh, you know, uh, bring in their uh, assets and facilities and so on, which will help the students. Incidentally, also, uh, I think at his intervention, he said, would you be able to take a student for a project? And uh, I did. Uh, I think they, he spent like something like six months. I think I think that was in the final year of MSc or something. I don't know, but uh, he was a good student and he actually built something, uh, simulated, and so the students are certainly very good quality. I see this, and I, I think you should keep up or maybe even even make it better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Data. You are absolutely right about the couch in Dr. Chitra's uh, office, <laughs> small office, where I had I had enjoyed. His hospitality, he would even make uh, black coffee for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've done the same, yes. <laughs> right. So, so uh, very nice. Thank you, Dr. Dattar, once again. So, I think, I think we are coming... Can I suggest uh, three names? Yeah, uh, please. Uh, Professor we still have, we'll still have three minutes, so one minute each, yes. So, Professor Antia, Professor Kandasami, and um, Professor Narasimha, anybody is there? Well, I am there. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, anyway, it has been a wonderful experience uh, listening to this, all this interesting. Oh, you have to start my video. Just a minute. Yeah. So, I suppose now you can see me. So, yeah, and the conference has been extremely well organized. And I'm sure some way then, Pushan have worked very hard. And of course, uh, and most uh, importantly, the students, because I could see them all the time. So they were definitely fully, fully involved and definitely they have put a lot of work. And I think uh, it has been a wonderful experience and everything has gone smoothly, despite all the whatever limitations we have because of the current situation, everything has gone perfectly fine. So I think all of them have to be commended for this. Thank you very much, uh, Antia. Uh, who else is around? Is I am there, Sorry. but like Kando, if he's there, let him speak first. Uh, I'm also here, Narsima. Okay, you go first, Narsima. Okay. Uh, first part, I have to be grateful to CBS for organizing this conference very well, professional way. Other thing there is the young faculty there, they have done well and more important, the students. And I was very happy to have through Zoom to talk to the students whom I talked or 
who did project with me and also the present students. I think yesterday before I started, I was very comfortable talking to them for about 10 minutes. But then since I had another meeting, I have to stop there. Otherwise, one could have gone more. So overall, it was well done. I do hope I will be able to personally come there sometime and talk to the students. It is very enjoyable. They are still just like five, six years ago, very enthusiastic and motivated. Keep it up. Uh, all of all of you have open invitation. Whenever you have a time, please do come to CVS. Thank you, Dr. Kandu, uh, 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 thank you, Dr. Dr. Yeah. Jain, and and also uh, uh, the previous speaker. Uh, Kandu, okay. Kandu, yeah. Kandu, Professor Kandu, yeah. Kandu is yeah, still here. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I just wanted to express that uh, fantastic. Well, I think uh, I got this mail from this mysterious organizing committee. Uh, I was wondering who is behind that. And then I realized one of them is Sanvev, who I know extremely well. I mean, we even wrote a paper together on magnetic fields and dynamos, if he remembers, before he got corrupted to quantum gravity. Uh, so it was fantastic. I think I really enjoyed all the talks. And it was very nice to see old friends, old in both ways. And I mean, it's a real tribute to Kumar because uh, although I didn't work with him for many years, any time that we ever met, he always pulled out some paper that he was writing at that time or discussing. I think I've seen, for example, some draft of Bhushan's paper with Kumar because we always talked science, even in the middle of all kinds of things. I have written a small bit for uh, our Ayuka magazine on my reminiscence. And one of the last things which I remember about Kumar was uh, he came for Govind Swaroop's 90th birthday. And he stayed at Ayuka guest house and we were sitting there. And he had one of these papers. I don't now remember which one. And we started discussing and working I mean, he was, uh, I was always telling him whatever I came to my head at that minute. And many people would come because he was a very useful person for many people for different, different reasons. So usually what would happen is some, there was a line of people, we are sitting there quietly discussing. They would come, they will ask him something, tell him something. He may make a phone call. He will sort out some difficulty. At the end of that conversation, we would be back to the paper. So this is the picture I have. In fact, this is what I've written at the end of the little bit that I wrote about him. That he was always interested in science, whatever, whatever it is that is, whatever other things people said. Finally, it was the science which mattered to him. And I think Narsima and uh, Antia would probably also completely agree that. We had a great time as uh, PhD students working with him. Um, he always had what I would call in his office, creative chaos. Yes. <laughs> but out of this creative chaos came around coherent thoughts and very neatly written down notes, equations, meticulously written down and uh, discussions that we all have enjoyed through the years. And thank you all at CBS for organizing this in his memory. Uh, it is really a tribute to him and I'm sure that wherever he is, he is probably enjoying all this conversation about science. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Kandaswami. Thank you, Dr. Narsima. Thank you, Dr. Antia. And also, of course, before that, all the students, Sambit and others. Uh, so I guess it's time to wrap up. Uh, perhaps the last word can be spoken by Dr. Jain on behalf of the CEBS, and then we conclude. Again, I express my sincere gratitude to each and everyone, speakers, invited speakers, plenary lectures, our mentors, our chairpersons, our students. Students is really a big workforce. And... Uh, of course, the, the magnitude and quality of 
were discussed in the conference. I am not the best person to say, but the experts in the uh, 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 who are who have spoken, they are the best judge. They have really expressed that quality of work presented in this symposium is extraordinarily very high standard. And I am thankful to each and everyone who have been associated with this, either as a participant, a speaker, chairperson, a student, to everyone. And we should keep such a trend in the future and we'll surely we should meet and keep doing good work. And with these few words, I again thank all of you and uh, declare the conference closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is the greatest tri tribute that one can pay to uh, a beloved uh, colleague, senior colleague for his scientific contributions and also for his human touch to everything that he did. Uh, okay, finally, uh, before wrapping up, I would like to express my condolences to the Chitre family and especially to Subarna Chitre. Uh, well, good evening then. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night sir. Uh, sir, before everyone leaves, I would request uh, you all to.